Good morning, good evening, everyone, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen from all over this world. Welcome to the UAB and Stock Exchange Seminar. Greeting from Beirut, the jewel of the Orient, the city that is rising from the ashes and healing from its deep wounds. From Beirut, I would like to welcome you all in this virtual conference and thank you for your participation. This online conference has been rescheduled, as we, everybody knows, rescheduled to, to today due to the global outage Zoom witness that last week, where the company publicly apologized for, and the proverb says, hopefully, every delay has its own blessing. Our deep gratitude goes to Sheikh Mohammed Jarrah Sabah, the chairman of the Union of Arab Banks, and also to Dr. Joseph Turbe, the chairman of the World Union of Arab Bankers, for their support and patronage of the conference and for their attendance. A particular thanks and appreciation are extended to the Arab Federation of Exchanges, represented by its chairman, Dr. Mohammed Farid Saleh, and its secretary general, Mr. Rami al -Dukani. A great appreci appreciation extended to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, represented by Dr. Jihad Al-Wazir and his team. We are very honored, Dr. Al-Wazir, by your participation in this important virtual or online forum. Another appreci appreciation also extended to our partner in this forum, the Frankfurt Main Finance, FMF, represented by its managing director, Mr. Hubert Tuzvath, Union of Arab Banks, Mr. Vaz, is very pleased and honored with the continuous cooperation with the FMF in different aspects. I would like also to thank and welcome the chairman and chief executives of the stock exchanges in the Arab world, in particular, Bahrain, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Palestine, and Egypt. I also would like to welcome the participation of the Association of Financial Market in Europe, represented by its chief executive, Mr. Adam Farkas, and the special participation of Arab Central Banks, UAB members, Visa International, and all participants. Excellencies, as you know, the banking sector is undergoing a radical transformation the shift includes changing business model, disruptive technologies, and compliance pressure. The emergence of non-bank startups, also referred to as fintech, are alerting the competitive <coughs> landscape in the banking industry. The club, on the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, is witnessing unmatched combination of geopolitical, economic, health, and social crisis that have changed the international economic and trade landscape. These events are the massive spread of COVID-19 pandemic. The mounting trade war between the two largest economies, the US and the China, and the, Bre and the Brexit bottleneck still dominating with a huge ambiguity and uncertainty. It's clear that each of these events alone is able to pose serious challenges for the global growth and replace global development. As for the Arab region, ladies and gentlemen, the widespread of COVID-19 crisis, coupled with the decline in oil prices, have placed the financial system under serious pressures. And the Arab region is experiencing a significant drop in demand for equity and debt instru instruments, tightened financial conditions, a higher risk premium, and lower bank profits. These negative developments require a considerable intervention from the Arab Central Bank to support a faster recovery of the regional financial market and particularly capital market. And this is the aim of our forum today. At the end, I would like finally to mention the future cooperation occurring between the Union of Arab Bank and the Arab Federation of Exchange, but I will leave this announcement and the detail to its Secretary General, our dear friend, Mr. Rami Adukani. Thank you so much. And Mr. Dukani, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, dear Wissam. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, today. Um, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this very important webinar. When I started the idea, talking to my dear friend uh, Wissam about it, and uh, we bluntly talked about how central banks have been helping stock exchanges uh, in 2020. And year 2020, my friends, wasn't uh, very kind to stock exchanges, as everyone knows. We have seen severe drops in most of, uh, uh, of our markets. However, the Arabian exchanges or Arab exchanges in our region have shown resilience in a way that, other than price uh, prices going down, but not all or the major exchanges did not shut down. There was a very clear mechanism for investors to go in and go out. So we did not see a lot of interruption into our uh, exchanges. We have seen central banks doing very uh, important steps to support stock exchanges. We have seen monetary policy steps in interest rate uh, cuts. We have seen injection of liquidity in several markets. It has uh, raised a lot of question between scholars whether this is a positive thing or a negative thing, if it's is it giving an, uh, an easy exit to investors. All of these ideas we're aiming to discuss today with all of our great audience. I would like to welcome everyone, all representatives from our uh, friends from the Union of Arab Banks, the World Union of uh, Arab Bankers, uh, Frankfurt Main Finance, and uh, our chairman from the Arab uh, Federation of Exchanges, Dr. Mohammed Farid, the executive chairman of the Egyptian Exchange as well. Not to be long on everyone, this will not be the last uh, cooperation between us and uh, UAB. We've been discussing now with the Union of Arab Banks a mega project and it basically runs around uh, unifying KYC between uh, commercial banks and stock exchanges. And we're undergoing a major study together in order to explore the similarities and differences between KYC requirements between commercial banks and uh, brokers and stock markets in each of our member countries in order to come up with uh, recommendations on how to unify and share KYC findings. And we're aiming by that to create uh, a unified Arabian invest code between all of our Arab countries. This is a mega project that we need cooperation and we need help. And uh, I do not want to extend my speech more than that to leave space to everyone else for their opening remarks. So thank you very much for being with us today. I hope you will find very fruitful discussions throughout the way. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Rami. Thank you. I think this is a great project to have a common KYC between the banks and the financial markets. This is really very, very, very good. And we're looking forward to work together. Uh, allow me on this occasion to welcome Mr. Michael Motassian, who is uh, participating in this conference. Uh, Michael is the uh, Chief Compliance Officer at the Arab Bank. At the same time, he is the co-chair of the MENA FCCG, which is a financial crime compliance group. It's a group of compliance content of 13 banks. If we have time, we will allow, uh, with the pleasure, of course, uh, Mr. Matusian to explain a little bit about MENA FCCG. And this common project between UAB and AFE uh, about the common KYC for, uh, for uh, banks and for stock exchange, I think the MENA FCCG has a big role because they, they are a group of expertise. Uh, I honor to be the chairman of MENA FCCG, but the mastermind of this group is really for Mr. Matusian. Uh, we will go on and I would like to welcome uh, Sheikh Mohammed Jarrah Sabah uh, for his speech. I think we're ready for his speech from Kuwait. السيادة. بداية لابد أن نتوقف حول ما تعرض له بيروت عاصمة بلدنا الحبيب لبنان نتيجة انفجار الخطير في مرافقها التاريخي الذي أودي بمئات الشهداء والألاف الجرح وأحدث دمارا كبيرا طاول معظم أرجاء المدينة نتقدم تعازينا الحارة إلى لبنان رئيسا وحكومة وشعبا سألين الله عز وجل أن يحمي لبنان وشعب الطيب وعاصمته الوفية وأن ينعم بالسلام والاستقرار الأخوة والأخوات يسعدني أن يتقدم باسمي وباسم مجلس إدارة اتحاد المصارف العربية وأمانته العامة بالشكر والتقدير 
على مشاركتكم في هذا الحوار الافتراضي والتأكيد معا على ضرورة مواصلة الحوار والتواصل لكي لا نغيب عن مسار المهنة المصرفية وبالتالي نحافظ على ما أنجزناه واستثمرناه في مواجهة الأزمات كما تعلمون أن عالمنا يواجه اليوم عدوا مشتركا والقطاعات المصرفية العربية والدولية واقعة تحت ضغط شديد يتطلب تحركا منسقا وحازما على صعيد السياسات وتكون سمته إعادة تشغيل المحرك الاقتصادي لبناء مجتمعات محصنة تتميز بالقوة والمناعة وهذا دليلنا في اتحاد المصارف العربية ومحور تفكيرنا ومناقشاتنا اليومية ما يترجم حرصنا على عدم التوقف عقارب الزمن أمام النهوض الاقتصادي والمصرفي في منطقتنا العربية مهما اشتدت الأزمات وتقطع سبل التواصل باعتبار أن المهنة المصرفية ليست قواعد وتشريعات وقوانين فحسب بل هي أيضا حالة تجدد داعم يواكب حركة تطور وظروف المجتمعات الاقتصادية والإنسانية لذلك لم نتوقف أمام شراسة فيروس كوفيد 19 بل واجهنا بتعزيز التواصل فيما بيننا وتواصلنا مع مراكز صنع القرار الدولية والعربية لنطلع على التجارب والإجراءات المتخذة في مواجهة هذه الأزمة وخصوصا مع صندوق النقد والبنك الدوليين والبنك الاحتياطي الفدرالي الأمريكي والمؤسسات المالية الدولية إضافة إلى البنوك المركزية العربية وأجرينا معهم لقاءات افتراضية وتبادلنا الدراسات والبحوث في هذا المجال وهنا أود أن أنوه بأهمية الثورة التكنولوجية التي أتاحت لنا جميعا الاستمرار في التواصل وتبادل الآراء والأفكار والتشاور في الحلول خصوصا وأننا في اتحاد المصارف العربية وقعنا مذكرات تفاهم وتعاون مع نخبة من شركات التكنولوجي والابتكار والتكنولوجيا المالية والتكنولوجيا الامتثال العالمية وهذه التكنولوجيا هي التي تجمعنا اليوم لنتفاكر في موضوع هام رأينا في اتحاد المصارف العربية أنه من الضروري الإضاءة عليه في هذه الظروف أعني به دعم البنوك المركزية لأسواق رأس المال في ظل جائحة كورونا ونهدف من هذا المؤتمر الافتراضي أن نسلط الضوء على واقع الأسواق المالية العربية وخاصة أسواق رأس المال وإجراءات تطويرها وتفعيلها وآليات تمويل طويل أجل في ظل الأزمة المستجدة كما نهدف إلى التركيز على دور المصارف المركزية العربية في تطوير وتفعيل أسواق رأس المال وتحفيز انخراط أكبر الشركات فيها أيها الأخوة والأخوات إن القيادات والكفاءات والخبرات المجتمع اليوم أمام هذه الشاشة الصغيرة ستتيح لنا بإذن الله أن نخرج بتوصيات عملية وأفكار ابتكارية ستساهم في تحقيق الأهداف المرجوة من هذا المؤتمر وأود في هذه المناسبة أن أشكر اتحاد البورصات العربية ممثلا بسعادة الدكتور محمد فريد صالح رئيس الاتحاد والأخ الأستاذ رامي الدكاني الأمين العام والشكر والتقدير موصول لسعادة الدكتور جهاد الوزير وسعادة الأستاذ بوبرتوس فات العضو المنتدب في مركز فرانكفورت الألماني والسادة رؤساء البورصات العربية في مصر والمملكة العربية السعودية ودبي ودار البيضاء وفلسطين وعمان وأرجو استمرار التعاون والتواصل الدائم فيما بيننا وستبقى منصة اتحاد المصارف العربية الإلكترونية مشرعة دائما لكل من يسعى إلى تطوير المهنة المصرفية وتعزيز مسيرة العمل العربي المشترك وشكرا لإسقائكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, we we'll go now to the uh, speech of Dr. Torbe, the chairman of World uh, Union of Arab Bankers. Are we ready for it? أصحاب المعالي والسعادة القيادات المالية والمصرفية المشاركة في هذا الحوار الافتراضي. 
يسرني بداية أن أحيي إخواني في قيادة اتحاد المصارف العربية الذي يتخذ من بيروت مقرا رئيسيا له أحييهم على العزيمة والنجاح في إبقاء الحوار قائما بين المرجعيات المالية العربية وتعزيز التواصل مع المؤسسات الدولية في وقت ضربت جائحة كورونا اقتصادات العالم أجمع وجمدت الدماء في شرايين الحياة البشرية فأقفلت البلدان حدودها وأوقفت شركات الطيران رحلاتها وانزوى ملايين البشر في بيوتهم تجنبا للاختلاط ونشأت سلوكيات جديدة على رأسها التباعد الاجتماعي وخيم السكون والركود على الاقتصاد العالمي وخسر ملايين البشر وظائفهم وأعمالهم حيث أصبح التقارب البشري والاجتماعي خطرا يهدد صحة الإنسان وحياته ووقفت الدول حيارة أمام خيارين أحلاهما مروا إما استمرار لمخاطر العدوى وهجرة الوظائف وتوقف الأعمال والموت الاقتصادي البطيء وإما العودة إلى الانفتاح الاقتصادي وتحمل كلفته على الصعيد الصحي والإنسان وقد فرضت جائحة كورونا تحديا تاريخيا تمثل بهبوط حاد بأسعار الأسهم وتوقف نشاط إصدار الأوراق المالية في الأسواق وهبوط أسعار النفط وتفاقم الركود الاقتصادي وتوسع البطالة وفقدان فرص العمل وقد واجهت البنوك المركزية في دولنا وفي العالم الأوسع هذه الأخطار برزم تمويل منعشة للمجتمعات وللاقتصاد بهدف الحفاظ على الاستقرار المالي وسلامة النظام المصرفي وكذلك تعزيز السيولة في الأسواق بالطبع لن أتوسع بهذه المواضيع التي سيتناولها السادة المشاركون بخبراتهم وتجاربهم وأشير في هذه العجلة إلى أن التجربة اللبنانية للقطاع المالي بما فيه البنك المركزي في مواجهة جائحة كورونا لا تختلف عن المعالجات التي وفرتها الأنظمة المالية في مختلف البلدان من تيسير لتمويل وتطويل مهل التسديد للقروض وكذلك تعزيز شبكات الأمان الاجتماعي ولكن ما يواجهه لبنان حاليا هو أدق وأخطر من جراء الانفجار الذي حصل في مرفأ بيروت في مطلع هذا الشهر والذي نقل البلاد من مكان إلى آخر وأوصلها إلى حالة غير مسبوقة من تتابع وتراكم الكوارث فمن أزمة سياسية غير مسبوقة تعاطت معها حكومة جديدة غير مجربة أخذت خيارات اقتصادية قاتلة أولها توقف لبنان عن تسديد ديونه الدولية لأول مرة في تاريخه الاقتصادي على الرغم من احتياطات بالعملة الأجنبية لدى البنك المركزي كانت متوفرة تتجاوز 22 مليار دولار واحتياط الذهب الذي يقارب 20 مليار دولار آخر مما تسبب بانهيار في المنظومة الاقتصادية وتدهور سعر النقد اللبناني وتزايد الضغوط على ميزان المدفوعات وقد أدى عدم السداد لاستحقاق سندات الدين الدولارية إلى تعجيل استحقاق كل الديون السيادية اللبنانية التي كانت تستحق أجالها المتعددة لغاية عام 2040 وأصبحت كلها معجلة الإداء بالطبع أنها كورونا مالية أصابت الاقتصاد اللبناني وهزت الثقة بمقوماته تبعها الانفجار المجرم الذي دمر جزءا غير يسير من بيروت 
مما استعجل سقوط الحكومة اللبنانية بعد حكم لم يتجاوز سبعة أشهر وهرع المجتمع الدولي والعربي للوقوف على الحالة اللبنانية التي أصبحت تتطلب معالجة دولية على كل الأصعدة ليعود لبنان للعب دوره ضمن العائلة العربية والدولية بعد أن أرهقته انعكاسات الصراع الأقليمي والدولي في محيطه والذي من بعض مظاهره إيواءه لمليون ونصف مليون لاجئ سوري وأكثر من أربعمائة ألف لاجئ فلسطيني تبخل عليهم من الأمم المتحدة بالكثير من متطلبات الإغاثة أن جائحة كورونا الصحية التي ضربت العالم وكذلك ضربت لبنان وتناوب الكوارث والأحداث على الساحة اللبنانية لن تنحصر تداعياتها السلبية على الوضع الاقتصادي والنقد فقط بل يبدو أنها سيكون لها عواقب سياسية وجيوسياسية تتطلب تعاونا دوليا لاحتوائها والمساعدة في حلها وأننا أمل بأن يحصل ذلك بالاتجاه الإيجابي وشكرا أصحاب المعالي و... طيب صبحي هلا كمي موريد مجددا شكرا ل ثانك يو سو ماتش دكتور توربي فور يور مسج اند اند اي هوب يور لوج ان ناو وي ويل جو ناو تو ذا مسج اوف ذا سبيتش اوف هيز اكسلنسي دكتور محمد فريد صالح ذا تشيرمان اوف عرب فيدريشن اوف اكشينج ار يو ريدي دكتور صالح؟ يس ايم ريدي ثانك يو جو اهد بليز ثانك يو يعني في اول الامر كان احدى اسئلتي الرئيسيه احنا بنتحدث باللغة العربية أم باللغة الإنجليزية قيل لي اللغة الإنجليزية طبعا ده يحرمنا من ثراء اللغة العربية والمصطلحات اللي ممكن كانت تستخدم يعني لإثراء هذا المؤتمر لكن يعني قررنا أن احنا إيه نتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية علشان السادة الزملاء من المؤسسات غير التي لا تتحدث يعني اللغة العربية كلغة لغتها الأولى Although first of all i would like to uh, thank you uh, mr wasam fatouh and uh, mr ramid dukani for the efforts for coming up with this uh, virtual conference and uh, for having uh, uh, i would say one of the uh, early collaboration Uh, and and one of the foremost collaboration between the Union of Arab Banks and as well the Arab Federation of Exchanges in its new, I would say, uh, an eager format to further develop capital markets in the Arab context. Uh, so basically, I, that, that's the starting point. I would like to thank you and commend you for your efforts and perseverance, despite uh, all of us are always uh, asking for more technological advancements. It failed us uh, last time. Uh, in this in this regard but uh, your perseverance allowed us to uh, reschedule the conference and to start again uh, i would like to uh, first of all as well uh, thank uh, sheikh uh, mohammed sabah uh, dr joseph torbi uh, and uh, hubert fath for attending uh, and giving the opening remarks i wouldn't take much long in the opening remarks uh, regarding this conference but i believe uh, that it is coming in one or in the midst of, uh, uh, I would say, the COVID-19 pandemic that is, um, uh, I would say, one of the most difficult tasks to deal with in terms of the banking sector, the capital market sector, and the entire financial sector in general, and the economy at large. The difference between this pandemic and any other financial crisis or even economic crises that took place uh, during the past, I would say, years, Uh, is its impact on the real economy. Here we're talking about the entire, I would say, value chain of the economy being uh, impacted negatively from a supply side, a demand side, and the intermediation process being uh, presented by either manufacturing or financing or whatever. So the, the, the pandemic and its severity 
uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the real economy and the financial sector as well is one of the things that would be remembered across history and uh, as well uh, the uh, our reactions at the exchanges and the financial sector would be remembered i hope uh, as well across history uh, that we have dealt uh, as prudently as possible during one of the toughest periods to be uh, facing i would say the financial sector um, I, I would like to speak today with pride, honestly speaking, pride uh, that despite all the difficulties, despite all the curfews, despite all, uh, uh, I would say, the, the pandemic itself and the fear of getting uh, sick uh, amongst all participants of exchanges and uh, investors as well, we managed as exchanges uh, to withstand I would say this difficult times and to create the technological advancements and uh, to adopt technology uh, to enable, uh, I would say, the smooth operation of exchanges. And despite the high volatility levels that have been witnessed, these volatility levels did not deter exchanges from continuing their daily operations uh, on a regular basis, which is, uh, I would say, the kernel and the core for the role of exchanges and the role of financial markets. And no one would have imagined in general to see the banking sector stop providing the services being provided to, uh, uh, I would say, their, the borrowers or the uh, uh, depositors or anything. So basically that is one, uh, apart from very few cases, but uh, the continuity of trading, despite all of these difficulties and hardships, uh, is making me to be uh, standing here in pride that we managed to withstand, at least from an operations perspective, all the difficulties associated with, uh, uh, with, with the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath. Uh, I believe this conference is of uh, paramount importance. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, probably the difference between the different crises uh, stems uh, from its impact on the various players in the economy. So one would ask, what, what, what's the role of central banks in the midst of all of this and midst of all of this volatility? I believe the question will be answered during the two-day course uh, of the conference in details. Uh, but I believe the answers would, would go beyond the traditional roles of central banks of being a prudential, I would say, setter or, uh, uh, or macro and micro prudential regulations being set, but as well from market stability and inv investors' uh, confidence boosting uh, uh, role that central banks can be playing in that regard uh, due to its uh, uh, outreach to all uh, sections of the value chain in this regard. And all of this without interfering with market dynamics and the smooth of operations of the markets. And this is one of the challenges. In every single crisis, we get to see unorthodox measures being undertaken either by uh, financial sector players or capital market players like exchanges or even uh, regulators and uh, monetary policy setters uh, like central banks and, and uh, the other stock market regulators. Uh, this has been witnessed in the 2008 international financial crisis with the quantitative easing that took place for years to ensure that the economies are responding and are growing back to its uh, normal levels as much as possible. Again, during this pandemic, the unorthodox measures that have been taken uh, by uh, the regulators and central banks, uh, I believe, uh, participated uh, and helped uh, uh, participants to withstand the storm associated with COVID-19. Uh, um, the staggering effect of the real uh, sector and the financial sector uh, would take us to uh, assess are these measures uh, quite sufficient? Do we need even um, uh, more measures? Because I believe not only from, uh, uh, or mainly from exchanges as well and regulators, not only from central banks, uh, because I believe the next steps is not only about withstanding the storm, it is about having further development and further uh, deepening of capital markets in, in our region. But with the deepening of capital markets comes uh, being susceptible or being uh, prone uh, to further volatility that needs to be managed uh, properly and needs to be accounted for uh, as we speak. Um, most of the events that we have been witnessing are tail events when we're talking about statistical distributions. These are tail events to be seeing them uh, as frequently as we have seen, uh, make them more uh, probable of seeing them again in the future. And the lesson learned here would be that uh, we need to take into account this important aspect in uh, our daily operations going forward and to mitigate the risks associated with, uh, with health issues, with the COVID-19 issues and the likes 
going forward in in the future i don't want to uh, uh, talk much and uh, and i would like as well to leave to the other speakers the chance to uh, uh, present or at least uh, have their opening remarks uh, and uh, i believe that in uh, the course of the sessions we will have significant and extensive discussions on uh, the role uh, of capital markets uh, the banking sector and the central banks uh, as a co global coordinator uh, for the entire financial sector to ensure, uh, I would say, uh, the proper functioning and uh, the proper growth of markets to ultimately do its role of availing finance efficiently and effectively to uh, uh, market participants and companies and to allow investors as well to be able to park their investments and park their savings uh, as efficiently as possible uh, in the future. Uh, I would like to thank you again for uh, Usam and Rami for for the conference and the arrangement and the patience associated uh, with the technological uh, uh, hindrances that took place. And I would like to leave uh, the floor uh, for the next speaker. Thank you. Dr. Saleh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your message. Uh, am I okay? Okay. Everybody can hear me, yes? Yes. All right. So we will go to, to Germany, to Frankfurt which I hope I can visit it next week. And we listen to the message of Mr. Habertus Bath. Are you ready, Mr. Bath? I'm ready. And uh, let, me, let, let me say, first of all, we make sure you will be able to, 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 to join us. <laughs> no worries. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a warm regard from Frankfurt. And first of all, on behalf of Frankfurt Main Finance, I would like to express our sincerest condolences to the people in Beirut. May wounds heal fast. I salute the Union of Arab Banks being able to organize today's events. There is no better proof of your, your city's great resilience and professionalism. Please allow me also the opportunity to express our great thanks to the World Union of Arab Bankers and the Arab Federation of Exchanges that we were able to join you as uh, today's supporters and sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll have the privilege now to sort of kick off the very topic of today's conference. 2020 is a historic year, not least because of Brexit, a US presidential election like we haven't seen any before, and the coronavirus pandemic. Our seminar today is about the role of central banks in supporting the capital markets amid the COVID-19 crisis. And ever since the famous Greenspan put 1987, that's how long it goes back, central banks have been on the front line in the fight against any crisis affecting the financial system. This was the case in the Asian financial crisis in 97, the Russian financial crisis in 98, the 9-11 shock, 21, the global financial crisis in 2008, and the euro crisis after 2010. And of course, even in the current crisis that's caused by a potentially deadly virus, the whole world looks again to the lords of money. In Beijing, Frankfurt, London, Tokyo, and Washington, and everywhere else with the central bank to use an alphabetical order. The challenge was unprecedented. A characterization which I usually don't like, it's way too often used and often abused, but in this case, it's appropriate. In March and April, as the scale and impact of the corona crisis pandemic became ever more clear and threatening, the disease spread from Far East to Iran, Australia, Europe, and then on to the Americas and Africa and also throughout your region. It was crippling economic and social life. Stock markets dived fast and furious and buyers were nowhere to be seen. When in March, even the mighty US treasury market became dysfunctional as hedge funds unwinded loss-making leverage carry trades in treasuries, we came close to a failed auction a situation not known in living memory. It caused panic in the market as the bottom seemed to be falling out 
of it. No other sense of central banks were seen as being able to stop the fall. Notwithstanding whatever dilemmas there was, no other credible tried and tested option at the time. Our central bank governor, Jens Weidmann, president of the Deutsche Bundesbank, addressed the dilemmas in a speech saying, decision makers face tough choices. What needs to be done? How far can we go? And do the ends justify the means? The obvious answer, he and his fellows at the European Central Bank, the FED, the Bank of Japan, and on many other central bank boards gave at the time was loud and clear, yes. Today, I would like to share with you three points from a distinct European perspective with a strong German accent, if you allow. First, as the global economic and financial conditions deteriorated rapidly, rapidly central banks formed a critical first line of defense in the crisis. When a shock such massive and uncertainty so high, Adjustments in markets do tend not to run orderly and smooth. Thus, it was important that the world central banks step in to stabilize financial conditions and create the time for markets to play their role in price detection under the new corona normal. The ECB, for example, developed its already stretched balance sheet even more. The ECB announced a 700 billion euro pandemic emergency purchase program in March. And then very soon after, decided to increase the package by another 600 billion. In addition, the program's horizon was extended from December 2020 to June 21. That was a quick increase and it was necessary because the program was truly employed. The ECB increased its balance sheet by almost 700 billion euros in just two months to 5,400 billions in May and continued ever since, however, at a much reduced pace. To make this massive wall of liquidity really work, the stimulus was accompanied by measures to increase the bank's ability and willingness to lend. As a Example, the ECB has temporarily relaxed minimum capital requirements, offering banks greater flexibility on supervisory timelines and procedures. All of these measures help Euro area banks focus on playing their role as lenders during this extraordinary period. In turn, the ECB expects banks to use any freed up fund to absorb losses and support the economy and banks were told not to pay out any dividends. The role of central banks, however, didn't stop here. Thanks only or mainly, that will be disputed by academics for a while. To their intervention, the markets had the trust in government action plans. Imagine what would have happened if auctions of treasuries or bonds would have failed at that time. That leads me to the next aspect. Europe was particularly successful in fighting COVID-19 as it relied implicitly on central bank backed effective coordination between state development and local bank. Let me make that clear at a German example. Waste not, want not is a very typical German proverb that characterizes the budgetary policy of the federal states and the state governments in Germany for quite a while. That precisely enabled the governments to maneuver with little strings attached. It allowed the German government to kickstart a recovery with what our uh, financial minister at that time called a kaboom. The total amount of state's budgetary measures reached in excess of 350 billion euros. And it was supported by a total amount of guarantees in excess of another 800 billion euros. All of the suffering companies and employees in affected industry can benefit what is called a protective shield. Borrowers apply for a loan from their local banks, which checks eligibility and creditworthiness. 
while the development bank, the biggest of which is KFW, provides the, bank, the funds. Depending on the program, the local bank can exempt 80, 90, or even up to 100% of the liability, while the development bank can easily refinance itself on the market. Obviously, this comes with varying rates, falling with the bank's risk uptake. Hence, every credit taker will have an incentive to make his or her bank take on some of the risk burden. This was made possible only by a change in the bankruptcy law as well that allowed lenders to stay afloat much longer despite on the background of the traditional rules being technically insolvent. Lastly, Europe believed in solidarity. As you may know, Germany took the presidency of the all-important Council of the European Union on July 1st. Together, together for Europe's recovery is the motto for these six months. On July 21st, the EU leaders finally reached a deal for a 750 billion euro recovery fund to help cushion the effects of the coronavirus induced economic slump. Cooperation is the most important thing in such circumstances. We believe that the global crisis requires a global response. As a result, under the lead of Frankfurt Main Finance, the World Association of International Financial Centers, which is comprised of the world's leading financial centers from four continents, published a report how global financial centers can help combat COVID-19 pandemic already in April this year. It's available online. The current corona crisis demonstrates the interconnectedness of our modern world and nowhere more than in finance. The Fed offered more than 400 billion US dollar swap lines for emerging market central banks, and they're only slowly going down. All states around the globe must collectively become more agile and co-opete, to use a term from the technology sector, which describes the uh, the, the very um, uh, aggregation of competition as well as cooperation. In such a spirit, it is very important that you cooperate on the very important things such as the rise, race to find the best vaccine and cooperate on publishing all the data around it. And then, however, you may compete thereafter again on coming up with the very best of the vaccine to the better of the world. Hopefully, by this cooperation, we can be better prepared for the next virus certain to come. If COVID-19 is going to be defeated, as it inevitably will, the world would be a better place if we can succeed reaching this with the spirit of cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Vaz, for this, this uh, very important message. I really thank you for your participation. I also would like to thank Dr. Muhammad Farid Saleh for this very important message as well. Uh, I'm happy that we are on time. Uh, before we move uh, forward, uh, allow me please just to welcome uh, some of the uh, Special participation, I would like to welcome His Excellency Mr. Wasim Mansouri. He's the first Vice Governor of Central Bank of Lebanon. Mr. Mansouri, we thank you so much for your time. We know very well, everybody knows that we are, you're facing a lot of challenges during this very important period to Lebanon. So we wish you all the best. I also would like to thank uh, for, uh, Mr. Martin Grant for his participation from New York, uh, Madam Mirvat Sultan from Egypt, and all other participants, as I can see on the screen. Uh, moving forward, uh, Dr. Al-Wazir, I'm really very happy for your participation. I'm very happy to meet you uh, also virtually. It's been a long time that we met last time. Uh, would like to welcome you and your team, Mr. Kelly. And uh, we, I give the floor for Dr. Jihad Al-Wazir, who is the Assistant Director, Monetary and Capital Market Department, and the Head of Central Banking Operation Division at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Dr. Al-Wazir, the floor is yes, yours. Are you ready? Yes, and I, uh, I tried to share my presentation, but the uh, system would not allow me, so I sent it by email. 
just in case if you can uh, if you can put it up uh, yeah yeah we yeah. can uh, all right we can. Uh, just to make sure you sent it uh, uh, all right we'll check uh, okay but please uh, but, tell me when you, uh, you want to uh, yeah. to click on the next slide يلا يلا ايه بلا يعني في البداية اولا اشكركم اشكرك وسام واتحاد المصارف العربية على هاي الدعوة الكريمة واضم صوتي للتعبير عن الحزن والامل للبنان بالعودة الى مكان عليه واتمنى لكم السلامة جميعا Okay, so uh, let me start uh, I, in English. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And it's a great pleasure to be with you, uh, with Union of Arab Banks, and to see you even virtually, uh, to see old friends from across the Arab world. And inshallah, next year we can meet face to face with COVID behind us, behind us and Lebanon is, in a, and is safely back. Uh, as time is short, uh, so we'll try to go through this uh, quickly. Uh, I joined with my colleague uh, Kelly Echo from the Monetary Capital Markets Department uh, and to present on central bank support for financial markets in time of COVID, which is also the title of the recent note we shared with central banks across the world, across the globe, and recently published uh, on the IMF. A series of notes to help mitigate the effects of COVID-19. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so these notes uh, cover uh, a whole variety of things. Uh, cover the fiscal, including tax law design uh, based on the new circumstances, monetary and financial policies, macro critical as well and structural, as well as uh, statistical and legal uh, related. Uh, uh, ideas uh, and how to handle uh, uh, these issues at the time of COVID and what kind of changes and arrangements uh, you would uh, you would and I would advise you uh, for more detail uh, to look at these and I think uh, they will be uh, very useful and helpful uh, to all. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, but first, uh, you know, to echo the other speakers, let me a bit. Uh, say a little bit about uh, the regional economic situation. Uh, the update on the global and the regional economic outlooks uh, will be forthcoming next month at the annual meeting, IMF uh, World Bank meetings, with the publications of the WIO and uh, the GFSR. Uh, but uh, as you can all see, the writing uh, uh, is on the wall. Uh, globally, growth was projected uh, in April to be about minus 4.9% in 2020. And uh, markets are reflecting conflicting forces of recovery and growth and concerns about the second wave of infections as well as geopolitical tensions. Uh, regionally, uh, the region has clearly been hit hard with both oil producing and oil importing countries being strongly affected. In addition to the severe impact on human health, the economic effects have been felt both through the supply and demand shocks, sharp falls in oil and commodity prices, decline in tourism and remittances, and falling domestic and external demand, a drop in consumer confidence and disruption in production and global supply chains. So it's not a pretty picture. And although recent indicators point to some improvements in economic activity, Uncertainty remains high and the situation is still challenging, especially for countries with pre-existing vulnerabilities and accordingly they face substantial stresses. There has been significant variation in the degree authorities have been able to respond uh, and that basically is determined by the size of existing buffers and the existing policy regime. Uh, next slide. So uh, the key task remains uh, to shield affected people and firms with large, timely, targeted sector measures, mainly fiscal in nature, 
So the region mostly, you know, uh, countries used cash transfers with subsidies, unemployment benefits, and credit guarantees. And uh, implement, uh, implementing these has been a little bit more complicated in, in, in the Arab world, particularly due to the large informal sector. And although the fiscal response is key, central banks around the world and in the region have been playing a very important role in damping the effect of the crisis and uh, try to maintain financial stability. And so uh, why central bank intervention? What is the objective of the intervention? Uh, the overriding concern is maintenance of financial stability, as I just said, and ensure an ad adequate flow of credit to business and households, prevent fire sales and asset markets, maintain banking sector stability, and ensure the functioning of the payment system. And interventions aim to support provision of monetary accommodation, of course. Uh, next slide. So, but there are monetary policy limitations in the region. Uh, uh, under fixed exchange rate regimes, as prevalent in many countries uh, in the region, notably in the Gulf, central banks are less able to provide the desired monetary stimulus to the economy. You have very limited space for autonomous monetary policy, and therefore policy reaction has, on average, been naturally constrained. Still, there are measures that central bank can implement to improve uh, the transmission to households and corporates, uh, and in many countries have implemented them. Uh, most central banks, uh, for example, have taken actions uh, to alleviate short-term liquidity strains in the financial sector, and another important policy action has been relaxation of macroprudential policy tools on banks and other credit institutions. But here, let me say two things uh, and two important challenges that, as Dr. Saleh has mentioned, uh, remain in the region. Uh, the two challenges were for central banks is improving liquidity management and uh, bond market development. And that's the point that Dr. Uh, Saleh, uh, the need to deepen the financial markets and, and the bond market uh, is a large uh, component of that, is something critical that if develop in the future will improve uh, resiliency and, and help uh, uh, safer markets in the future. Uh, so uh, central uh, banks uh, sought to alleviate credit concern uh, constraints on non-financial sector more directly. And even, you know, uh, while, we're, you know, the slide is about which markets, but as I mentioned before, uh, the measures were largely fiscal and uh, due to the constrained monetary policy. And these measures included funding for lending schemes, uh, uh, providing collateralized long-term funding for financial intermediaries, intermediaries linked to the provision of new credit specific to specific sectors in the economy, uh, supporting lending uh, to smaller borrowers, uh, while preserving the existing intermediation relationship with the, within the banking system. Uh, and a critical element here is uh, for appropriate colorization is the need for strong governance and, uh, uh, to, and to minimize uh, the risk to central banks' uh, credit exposure. And of course, uh, in many of the countries, there was a relaxation of microprudential policy tools. Um, so uh, which markets? Uh, domestic bond markets remain very small in many countries. And corporate bond issuance uh, is less than 2% of GDP in most GCC countries. So, so uh, the, and the choice of markets is limited. Uh, and so uh, uh, looking at, uh, at which markets, Uh, markets that play the most crucial role in financial intermediation and are most highly interconnected uh, should be the forces of attention. Of attention. And then uh, and, uh, those that are large and liquid with high qu credit quality. Uh, 
Uh, and then in, in globally, you have two systems. You have the bank-based credit intermediation uh, uh, as well as the market-based credit intermediation. And then in our region, it's the uh, bank-based credit uh, uh, intermediation that is dominant. And so uh, we're looking at funding markets such as interbank credit, bank bills and bonds, treasury bills and bonds, commercial paper, and foreign exchange funding. And as well as, uh, you know, hedging markets uh, uh, with uh, FX spot market as well as FX swaps. In the, in the market-based uh, credit intermediation, uh, the picture gets bigger. So the focus would be on securities markets, commercial paper, corporate bonds, mortgage bonds, asset-backed securities, and in rare circumstances on equities. And of course, there are the hedging markets where uh, repos, uh, foreign exchange, and interest rate swaps are also used uh, to mitigate uh, and, and central banks can use them to intervene in the market. And I stop here and give the floor to Kelly uh, if he's uh, available. Kelly? Thank you very much, Jihad. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so here in the, in the fund, we've compiled a uh, database of the types of actions that uh, central banks around the world have taken since the COVID crisis. Um, this slide here illustrates just how broad-based the response has been by central banks around the world um, to the crisis, where we see it seems um, it doesn't matter if, if it's an advanced economy or an emerging market, the nature of the inflation targeting or monetary targeting regimes or whether you're a lower income country, all of these countries have seen quite a lot of interventions um, going on since the crisis. So it truly has been a, uh, a, a problem that just about every central bank has had to face. If we go on to the region, if we go to the next slide, um, well, in terms of objectives of what central banks are doing, I mean, we see that there has a, been a strong focus on easing stress in funding markets, whether they be short-term or long-term funding markets and in the foreign exchange market. Um, and that's around the world, and it's also resonates strongly with what we see in the region as well. Um, if we could perhaps go to the next slide. And the one after that. Thank you. So uh, with the central banks in the MCD region and the countries that are represented here today, um, the structure of the, uh, the capital and financial markets in the region has really dictated um, what MCD central banks have been trying to achieve. So we see that by far and away the most common types of interventions have been to stabilise short-term funding markets um, to some extent, longer term funding markets and this, the foreign exchange market. Um, activity to ease stress in securities markets is, is, is less, less common. Um, you know, reflecting what um, Jihad was saying earlier, that those markets are not quite as prominent as they are if you say look in some of the advanced economies or the major financial centres where central banks have had to do a lot more. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is an example of um, a range of um, objectives that uh, central banks in the region have, um, have, have employed. Um, it, it basically just illustrates the point made earlier that the focus has been on funding markets and to the extent to which possible monetary policy has been eased. Um, there has been not so much activity in securities markets. 
we have one um, notable exception, which was in Egypt, where there was a uh, an initiative by the central bank to support uh, equity markets, which was um, an interesting innovation. If we go through um, to the next slide, just to reiterate, so the most frequent set of intervention concerns have been stabilizing those funding markets, the short-term funding markets. These are the markets that banks in particular rely on to be able to provide credit and um, obviously to maintain the stability of the banking sector, which is a key part of the financial, um, financial sector. Um, there's also been um, a quite a lot of intervention in foreign exchange markets. Um, this is because in emerging markets, there's been, there was for a while cons considerable pressures on capital flows. So there was significant outflows of capital and central banks need to buff, needed to buffer those um, effects on the financial system um, through FX intervention. Um, there's a bit less, as I mentioned, activity going on in the long-term funding markets and the securities markets reflecting their lower prominence. Um, if we look at, say, uh, the frequency of interventions, there has been some tendency for increased use of derivatives interventions, um, particularly in countries in the region which have more flexible exchange rate regimes. Um, so, you know, using things like forward markets and swaps markets for intervention purposes, um, particularly since those types of instruments are quite important for um, allowing underlying users of markets to be able to hedge. Um, and I guess the, uh, the other point that comes out here, which resonates with what um, Jihad was speaking about earlier, is the increased popularity of funding for lending schemes in emerging markets and in this region as well. Um, you know, perhaps before this, the funding for lending type schemes were seen mainly in some of the larger advanced economies, but now they've certainly become much more popular and prevalent all around the world now, including in, in emerging markets and lower income countries. Um, so the central banks have really had to expand their toolkit um, to combat the, the, the far reaching implications of this particular crisis. If we go to, that's the, the end of the sort of the, the themes from our database. Um, Jihad, shall I hand it back to you to, to conclude the presentation? Yes, so uh, uh, thank you all and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Don't. You're on mute, Wissam. I'm mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Kerry. Thank you so much, Dr. Wazir. So, uh, Madami, Mr. Rami, do you have a question or we'll just go on? Then we postpone the question to later on. I have a one tiny question I've, I've noticed in, in one of the slides that you can, that you encourage intervening in many products, but you came to the equities part and you said rarely. Can you uh, explain more on that since we are in, uh, talking about stock markets mainly here? Well, I, I mean, you know, like in, 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 this is like the last uh, for central banks, particularly in, in, uh, uh, in advanced economies, uh, you know, you go down the chain through, you know, the various instruments and then the last, uh, you know, the last resort is to go to, to the equity market. I guess in the region it's a bit different. And then, uh, like, I, you know, like Kelly said, uh, there was one proposal to intervene in the markets in Egypt, but I don't think that was acted on because the situation improved and stabilized. Uh, and then, of course, there are risks in the future because once you, you know, uh, uh, price discovery becomes much more difficult when the government uh, intervenes or the central bank intervenes. That in in the longer term would have some distorting effect on the market. So uh, it is, you know, it, you know, so central banks w basically, they just want to maintain financial stability and ensure the system uh, does not get affected to a way that would impact the transmission of monetary policy and financial stability. 
And so uh, uh, you want to try to avoid also have the distributional effect on, uh, on, on the, so which sectors do you intervene and which, mark, which, which companies do you support and, uh, and why you support the richer country, the richer, you know, the more uh, uh, larger size uh, companies versus smaller size companies. So it is something that probably uh, uh, is very difficult for central banks to, get in, uh, to engage in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. All right. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we move forward. We would like to welcome Mr. Adam Farkas from uh, Association of Financial Market in Europe. Uh, you're the chief executive. We are very honored by your participation. Probably this is the first time uh, you participate with the Union of Arab Banks. We are most welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, your, your Excellencies, dear friends. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to your uh, to your conference. And before I um, I start my short intervention, I would like to also join others expressing uh, my deep condolences uh, to the to the people of Beirut and and, and Lebanon um, on the uh, on, on, on the great suffering which was caused by the by, by the unfortunate development uh, recently which added to the pain of COVID-19 and, uh, and the general economic difficulties which we are all experiencing as a result of COVID-19. Um, what, what I would like to talk about uh, today is, um, is to market from the, from the market side, um, how the central bank interventions were seen by the markets and how, um, how markets reacted to, uh, to these interventions and how central banks' interventions were um, uh, extremely crucial to maintain the orderly functioning of markets um, across the globe. Um, and I will, I will make some specific um, uh, illustration of, 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 of this in, in the European context, which of course um, I'm much more familiar with. Um, first of all, in terms of the central bank interventions, I think we have seen a number of the previous speakers um, outlining what types of interventions we are talking about. Um, my way of approaching it from a market point of view and not going into the regulatory uh, reliefs which were provided by the, uh, by, by, by the central banks and the regulatory community, the market interventions of, of central banks could be grouped into three main categories, again, coming from a, from a market point of view. One category, I would say, are the liquidity facilities, which the which central banks extended very rapidly and very robustly um, across the developed market and as well as uh, across emerging markets. And these include, of course, uh, the FX uh, facilities related to uh, to FX markets. And these most notably include the uh, the swap lines with some of the uh, major central banks uh, extended to uh, to um, uh, less developed, smaller, or emerging markets, in order to uh, to provide access, continuous access to these uh, to these local markets, to uh, to major currencies um, across across the globe. So th these liquidity facilities were uh, were uh, instrumental in maintaining uh, short-term financial stability, um, allowing uh, the uh, the different actors to access um, uh, short-term liquidity in different currencies everywhere uh, uh, around the globe. The second main group of interventions, um, I would say, would be the type of asset purchases uh, in which uh, central banks um, stepped out of their, let's say, um, traditional role and extended and expanded their asset purchase programs, uh, both in, in, um, in, in the short term end of the market, um, going into the types of assets which previously they did not, um, they did not use to purchase as well as um, underpinning uh, asset purchases of low securities and therefore uh, or thereby stabilizing the access to, um, uh, to market of uh, even major governments, uh, but also the corporate sector, which, uh, which is using the bond market as, um, as, as, a, as a major funding source. And the third group of, um, of interventions, I, and, and, and these have been already uh, discussed by the, by the fellow speakers, are the types of programs which are grouped as funding for lending or refinancing operations in which central banks try to make sure that the banking sector 
uh, where the banking intermediation is, is, is dominant or very strong, the banking sector maintains um, the flow of credit to the real economy despite the turbulence um, uh, resulting uh, from the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So the, the, these, um, the combination of these measures, um, as, 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 as we heard before, were extremely large in terms of scale extremely comprehensive and in a lot of cases really well coordinated across, across the globe uh, and therefore um, markets remained um, uh, relatively stable despite the fact that uh, initially uh, there were um, major movement of prices, uh, major uh, issues of, uh, of lack of liquidity in different pockets of the market, but central bank intervention managed to provide this uh, stability. Now let's go to the other side. How markets reacted to uh, to, to these uh, to these measures? The first um, uh, the first point I would like to make, which I think is uh, right now is, is it seems to be like an obvious uh, consequence or a co obvious development. But in past crises, it was not always um, obvious, and and of course uh, we we would would have never known that this would be the case in in in, in a global uh, crisis of this scale. But we can say that markets generally remained open and they remained orderly, despite the fact that um, volatility increased significantly and volumes of, of, of trading both in fixed income and equities markets uh, and derivative markets significantly increased at the beginning of the crisis because of the uh, reposition of, of different actors um, across, across the globe. Now, the, this, is, this is very important because what we tend to forget, that if, if markets are not open, if markets are not functioning, if, if markets are not orderly, if markets do not allow um, price discovery and do not allow um, uh, economic agents to trade with each other, uh, then a lot of these measures, which we, which we mentioned, would not be effective because they would not, they would not be able uh, to reach the, the recipients and they would not be able to uh, achieve their initial objective. So keeping markets open and orderly was, was a key uh, objective and a key achievement in, in this crisis. And all, all of this in the backdrop of a health pandemic where uh, we, we individually as well as collectively in, in institutions, we were all concerned about the well-being and health of our, of our colleagues and, and the society as a whole. So banks had to uh, remain open and functional and orderly in the context of um, actually moving our own people out to, um, to secondary sites, recovery sites, and then um, to, to respective um, home working stations uh, with all the operational and technological challenges that, that, this would, um, that this would entail. So I think it is very important uh, to, to note that this, this happened very smoothly and central bank support was instrumental in ensuring this, this sort of uh, stability. The second point, related point I would make is that market infrastructure generally, stock exchanges, um, clearing houses, um, uh, central depositories and other parts of the infrastructure also remained resilient. Um, our members, the major banks, um, have um, had a lot of concerns uh, re regarding how resilient these infrastructure uh, pieces will, will remain uh, so we, we run a big study globally uh, and we found that market infrastructure um, um, participants or market infrastructure players had ex uh, really robust contingency plans. They managed to remain um, resilient and, and they, they also performed and, and functioned without um, any major fallouts uh, during, the, during the crisis so far. Now, if we look at what, what actually happened in the market in terms of numbers and, and developments, I can give you a little bit of a, of, of a flavor from, uh, from a European perspective um, when, where we um, uh, published reports of, um, of, of, of the numbers of, of, of market developments in the, uh, the most recent numbers are second quarter of, of, of this year. And what we did see in the, in, in, the, in the market space is that investment grade issuances of bonds uh, reached a record level in, in, in Europe. Um, the net issuance uh, was over 225 billion euros in, in the second quarter only. High yield issuance um, uh, was also uh, pretty strong, although it, it showed a bit of a decrease from, uh, from, the, from the same period of last year. 
but high yield bonds also uh, managed to sell for about 70 billion euros in the in the second quarter what was also interesting that ESG um, so um, sort of green bonds and social bonds um, recorded a, an issuance of 55 billion so the the, the, the uh, sort of the green transition agenda of, of, of Europe was not hindered by the by the COVID-19 because markets remained um, uh, functional and open if I go to the uh, to the equities markets, um, what we did see was that um, IPOs, so initial public offerings, uh, were pretty much frozen. Um, in the second quarter, the, the market opened up, but the net uh, issuance was only around 3.6 billion euros in, 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 in the entire European market. And secondary issuance um, uh, was, was much stronger. Uh, so, so companies managed to issue uh, add-on um, um, uh, shares and increase, increase their capital in the second quarter by about um, 28 billion euros in total. Um, the, the big issue, of course, is that smaller companies who are, who are growing and trying to tap the equity market, they had, uh, they had great difficulty accessing the market. The total issuance was um, only around 2.7 billion in, 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 in the same period. What we did see in, in, in market uh, price developments is that bid-ask spreads in the, in, in the securities markets, in secondary markets, are still up by about 30-40% compared to, let's say, pre-COVID normal uh, market conditions. And, and the volatility of equity and, and, and fixed income prices uh, are significantly above the, uh, the pre-crisis um, uh, period. Um, coming back to the funding of, uh, of the corporate sector, and of course, different markets have different levels of development in, in providing um, uh, public equity uh, financing. The, the bank channel in Europe, as we all know, is still uh, extremely strong. So what we have seen was a record net lending to the real economy, to, uh, to the corporate sector. And this was, of course, um, a, a result of... Um, of unprecedented government support in the form of guarantees, which uh, we, we tried to add and we came to a staggering number of about 2.6 trillion euros of different guarantee facilities being offered in, uh, in Europe in this period in response to the COVID, uh, COVID crisis. But of course, that, that's more of a, a, fiscal, um, a fiscal pillar of the, of the public sector response. But it's very important that with the funding for lending schemes of central banks, which provided the, the funding, with the guarantees of, um, of, 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 of governments, uh, lending continued to, uh, to flow to the economy um, in, in, in this period. So all in all, to, uh, to, to, to sum it up, I, I would say that um, central bank intervention, central bank support um, has been critical um, for, the, for, 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 the, uh, for the global financial markets. Um, market participants reacted um, very strongly and very positively uh, it was crucial that market remain, markets remained open, um, resilient, and continued to provide their function um, for hedging, for access to finance, and to, uh, to uh, allow monetary policy to, to transmit its, um, its policy objectives in, in, in general to the economy. I will stop here, and of course, um, we'll be very happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Farkas. Um, I have many many questions but one question which is i really find it uh, interesting so uh, the question is uh, what the message is actually hi would be great to discuss some po of policy measures adjustments which already been taken and how that enhanced or solved the liquidity issues i don't know can dr al-wazir or kelly mr kelly can answer this question please Dr. Dr. Jihad. Hello. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. There, there are many, many messages and comment on your intervention, but I mentioned only one of them because of the time. Uh, it would be, I, I'm, I'm reading it. It would be great to discuss some of the uh, some of policy measures, adjustments, which already been taken and how that enhanced or solved the liquidity issues. 
Well, uh, I mean, uh, and globally, of course, uh, as the other speakers also have said, uh, the quick action by central banks have really saved the day. Uh, it is unprecedented what has been done. Uh, trillions of dollars have been in, injected into the markets uh, quickly in record time and uh, effectively, and they were able to sustain uh, uh, the financial markets and, and, and really maintain financial stability. Uh, in the region, uh, also there were uh, uh, interventions primarily on, uh, you know, on, on providing liquidity in the market, uh, particularly, as I said before, it is a bank uh, intermediated uh, uh, system, and mostly in the Arab world, and so the relationship between central banks and banks uh, in trying to ensure that there is enough liquidity in the system. And in addition to that, uh, uh, you know, because of the uh, lack of depth in many, in many markets in terms of on the capital market, uh, uh, so uh, the interventions uh, shifted to the fiscal side where, uh, you know, this funding for lending schemes and other uh, credit uh, measures that were taken by uh, other central banks. And I know uh, my friend uh, and colleague Maher Sheikh will be uh, speaking later on and then he can probably tell you more about the Jordan experience, for example, on, on these interventions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jihad. Now I will leave the, uh, moderation to Rami, Rami, Mr. Rami Dukyan, and he's going to moderate this session, the panel discussion. So are you ready, Rami? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, thank you, uh, That's Dr. Wasim from Central Bank, from Banque de Libon. Yes. So I'll introduce everyone in, uh, in the panel. Now we're going to get more in depth about uh, how central banks supported capital markets during the, the crisis. We have a fantastic panel. We have four main speakers. We have uh, Mr. Sh uh, Sheikh Khalifa Al Khalifa, the CEO of Bahrain Bourse. We have Dr. Mohammed Farid Saleh, Chairman of AFE and Executive Chairman of the Egyptian Exchange. We have Dr. Wasim Mansouri, the first Vice Governor of Bank de Liban. And Mr. Ayman Sijni, I hope I'm going to be able to see you. Dr. Ayman, can you hear us? You are most welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so now Mr. Rami Dukan, he's moderating just to make sure that you are online. Thank you very yes. much. Uh, of course, Mr. Ayman is the CEO of the Islamic Cooperation for the Development of the Private Sector uh, from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I would like to take the chance to personally welcome Dr. Wissam Mansouri. And uh, I would like to say this in, in, in Arabic, if you allow me. Uh, and after the explosion, uh, my Lebanese friends say, now we have Aish Wumal Houdam. But Dr. Wissam, I would like to give you two minutes uh, because I know that you have a nice message you want to deliver. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, first, I'm going to speak in Arabic, so I'm going to speak in Arabic. Now, I'm not going to see you in the camera, so I'm not going to see you in the camera. I'm going to see you in the bank. If I'm not going to show you, I'm going to put a picture on you, so I'm going to see you in the camera. I'm going to see you in the camera. أولاً شكراً لما شاعركم جميعاً شكراً لكل الكلمات من أول ما بلشت لحد الآن على التعاطف مع الوضع اللبناني طبعاً الوضع الوضع اللبناني هو وضع استثنائي جداً خطير جداً بطبيعة الحال بشكر مشاعركم جداً I will shift to English in order to everybody can hear me and understand me because everybody also has said very uh, kind word about a uh, word about Lebanon. We are very touched here for uh, and with all the support we are uh, seeking and we are seeing here uh, internationally and uh, more specifically in this conference. Uh, let me before I, I read some uh, or I say to say some word uh, about the subject. I would like to thank you to thank very much organizers uh, with some uh, Mr. Wissam Fatouh and yourself, Mr. Uh, Rami uh, Dukhani, about uh, uh, all this uh, difficult uh, work that you, ha you have been doing in order to organize this very interesting uh, sessions. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, my, I, I will read a small word about the situation here in Lebanon. As you know, why the global health crisis and large-scale lockdown resulting from COVID-19 have been largely impacting economies and financial markets globally, it is worth noting that in Lebanon, this is yet another crisis magnifying the countless already deep pre-existing political, economic, and financial predicaments. Lebanon has been struggling well before the coronavirus shut down, as you, as you know. Unstable political circumstances in the country, along with the regional unrest and the burdens of the Syrian crisis, have impaired the Lebanese economy for several years now. The outbreak of nationwide and government protests in October 17 has further exacerbated the economic environment, cutting deeper into Lebanese main economic indicators, such as foreign investment, consumption, tourism, and real estate. Now, the potential damage on Lebanon's top sectors, such as tourism and hospitality, is expected to be disastrous, with the accelerating spread of COVID-19 coinciding with the catastrophic port explosion in Beirut. In summary, Lebanon has been living multiple shocks lately. The first one, with the liquidity crisis and the pressure on the Lebanese lira exchange rate, the second one was the government's decision to discontinue payments on all its outstanding U.S. dollar denominating euro bonds. The third one was the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbating a recession in all economic sectors. The fourth one was the Beirut port explosion causing major destruction in Lebanese capitals. And the last one was the resignation of the government. As you can see, it's a lot for a, a small country, small economy like Lebanon. This consecutive crisis could not have become at a worse time for the Lebanese who are already struggling to make ends meet. According to the Institute of International Finance, Laced estimate GDP growth is projected to contract by 24% in 2020, following a previous forecast in May 2020 of a 15% contraction. In the midst of these challenging circumstances, BDL has been deploying all measures to help the economy survive, protect depositors' money at the Lebanese banks, support businesses during pandemic to ensure that workers still have jobs to return to, and provide assistance to individuals and companies affected by the Beirut port explosion. Since the beginning of the liquidity crisis, BDL has been creating mechanisms through Lebanese banks to allow the, small, the smooth import of fuel, wheat, medication, and medical materials after importance of these vital supplies complained about the dollar shortages. Furthermore, and in order to strengthen the bank's position, BDL has asked banks to refrain from distributing dividends for financial years 2019 and 2020, and to increase their capital by 20% by the end of December 2020. It has also asked banks to comply with new minimum capital requirements ratios and capital conservation buffers. Concerning interest rate, BDL has issued circulars reducing rates on bank deposits in Lebanese pounds and US dollars and requesting banks to reflect the decline on the Beirut reference rate for lending. In order to help the Lebanese industries, BDL announced in March the decision to launch the Lebanese Economy Oxygen Fund. This, res this rescue initiative aim aims to extend short-term credit facilities to help Lebanese industrial firms finance low materials imports by raising around 750 million with the support of BDL, international investors, dev development finance institutions, and family offices. This will be done in partnership with the Lebanese banks and in coordination with the Association of Lebanese Industrialists and the Ministry of Industry. It will be a Europe-based platform with a mix of fintech and credit facilities. This fund will constitute a permanent solution, a permanent solution for the import of raw materials following the recent introduction by BDL of a temporarily 100 million US dollars import facilities for industrial sectors in February 2020. In the same context, BDL issued a circular in May informing banks that BDL would supply them with 90% of the value of raw materials imported in foreign currencies for the use of industries in the in, in, in an effort to lessen 
the hike in prices of basic foods, commodities, and in coordination with the Ministry of Economy and Trade. BDL issued another circular in May informing banks operating in Lebanon that it would provide them with foreign currencies to finance the import of basic foods, items, and raw materials necessary for the food industry in the country. Among other measures taken to deal with the daily challenges faced by the Lebanese citizens, BDL has provided support to individuals and businesses impacted by the Beirut port explosion of August, 5th, uh, of August 4. Based on a circular issued August 6, BDL has created a mechanism allowing banks to extend exceptional loans that are not subject to any interest rate or commissions and that can be repaid over a period of five years. In a recent move to receive the Lebanese banking sector, uh, to, re to revive the Lebanese banking sector uh, activities, BDL issued a basic circular on August 27, asking banks to ensure by 28 February 2021, a balance in an external account free from any obligations with their corresponding banks, of course, not less than 3% of their total clients deposit as at the end of July 2020. Moreover, they are requested to recapitalize and to conduct a fair evaluation of their assets and liabilities. The circular also instructed banks to urge depositors who transferred more than 500,000 US dollars abroad as of July 1st, 2017, to deposit fresh, fresh funds in a special account in Lebanon, of course, frozen for five years and equivalent to 15% of the transfer's amount in order to boost liquidity. The circular applies to banks' shared persons, board members, large shareholders, CEOs, and perhaps politically exposed persons who are asked to transfer back 30% of any amount transferred abroad. In addition, but the air circular indicated that banks can provide depositors with an option to convert their deposits into shares in the bank's capital or into redeemable, tradable, and convertible perpetual bonds. Now, as regarding the financial markets and well before the escalation of the above mentioned challenging conditions, BDL and the Capital Markets Authority, which is the regulatory authority of the capital markets in Lebanon, have thought to issue circulars and regulations that benefit the Lebanese economy in conformity with the belief that market economy and the enhancement of entrepreneurship are the right approach for creating health and job opportunities in Lebanon. In the past few years, BDL has contributed to the emergence of the knowledge economy sector in Lebanon through Circular 331, which has provided the necessary funding for the digital economy by creating a synergy between the banking sector and entrepreneurs. The CMA has granted a license in June 2019 to a local private entity and the Athen Stock Exchange to set up and operate an electronic platform where shares, commercial papers, currencies, gold, and other financial products will be traded. Preparations were underway last year to launch this platform which will be able to provide the necessary equity and liquidity for SMEs and facilitate the access of the Lebanese diaspora and people from around the world to the Lebanese markets, thus boosting investment in the Lebanese economy. That would be a vital to help the various economy sectors survive the current recession and grow especially the SMEs that are more vulnerable than other uh, corporations. BDL has also highlighted the importance of privatization, the Beirut Stock Exchange, by the government to improve its performance and boost the financing of the private sector. Within the framework of regional cooperation, the, CME, the CMA has been pursuing its effort to strengthen relations with the regional as well international regulatory, regulatory bodies. It is very important to encourage the integration of Arab stock exchanges and the consolidation of the clearing and settlement system in the Arab countries. In fact, we are looking forward for a brighter future whereby Arab financial market authorities will cooperate and establish a regional Arab This being said, and given the current situation in Lebanon, 
PDL can no longer act alone. PDL can no longer act alone and faster progress in political reconciliation, cabinet formation, as well as economic transparency are crucial to meeting, to meeting the country's desperate need to implement the necessary fiscal and structural reforms. This will be needed catalyst for the international community to pledge financial support, paving the way for the Lebanese economy to regain momentum and achieve its full potential. Thank you very much for giving to me. And again, thank you very much for your kind organization and your kind. Uh, Dr. Mansouri, thank you very much for your uh, kind words. And uh, I was in a meeting with uh, His Excellency, Mr. Riyadh Salama, last week, and uh, I personally expressed that any technical assistance that we can provide to uh, Lebanon and to BDL and to the Capital Markets Authority in, in Beirut will never hesitate to help out. So uh, we're here to help, and I think all our colleagues uh, all the unions uh, and Arab unions also are eager to help uh, Lebanon to come back to its, uh, to its known history in financial services. So let's jump uh, quickly into the, the topic of the panel. We have seen starting the year of uh, 2020, a lot of our capital market, the Arabian capital markets, uh, strong reductions. We have seen severe sellout processes uh, in, in most of the markets. Uh, many of our exchanges did not uh, heal yet from the, the shocks. However, we have seen a lot of uh, momentum getting back in the last uh, few months. Uh, foreign investors are, have been injecting more liquidity and more uh, foreign currency, whether in uh, government bonds or into the equity markets. So I would like to start uh, asking uh, Dr. Mohamed Farid about his experience in, in, in what happened to Egypt. Yani in the beginning of 2020, the EGX 30 index was around 14,000 points and it reached at a point uh, lower than 10,000, but now we're talking it's around 11,400 uh, points. We have seen support from the Egyptian government. We have seen a lot of policies. We have seen a lot of uh, procedures have been taken inside EGX to protect the investors. Can you shed some light on, on that topic, please? <clears throat> First of all, uh, thanks, Dr. Mansouri, for the thorough presentation about the uh, Central Bank of Lebanon's role in the in, in, in trying to make the economy withstand the effects of the corona and the other things uh, that happened in, in Lebanon. Um, I, I have to disagree a little bit, uh, Mr. Rami, with, with the premise of the question, uh, honestly speaking. Uh, at the end, exchanges are not responsible whatsoever for any price directions. And we should not be driven or intrigued in our policy responses uh, because uh, of price directions. Otherwise, uh, we would turn uh, from market, uh, I would say, operators, uh, organizers of the market to uh, participants of the markets. And this is one of the premises that is not worrying, I would say, either to the Egyptian exchange, and I believe all other, uh, I would say, colleagues from other exchanges would agree on that point. What we might be worried about a little bit would be the volatility levels rather than the price levels of the underlying assets. Uh, and this, I would agree with you, that volatility levels definitely is worrying to uh, exchange. However, um, given that this was an international, uh, I would say, aspect uh, or the COVID-19, it's not uh, 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 related to any particular market. It is actually an international thing and its impact is on uh, all markets, whether we're talking about developed markets um, and for the first time to see volatility levels unprecedented during the uh, uh, intraday session itself, not, not only per session, but during the session itself, we get to see volatility that was unprecedented in uh, advanced markets. The same applies to emerging markets and the same applies as well to frontier markets uh, in terms of trading. So, uh, and I do agree with you that in the initial phases and from the initial uh, case that was uh, uh, the, the initial COVID-19 case that was discovered in, in Egypt, it was in February 14th, um, the market took a toll 
uh, when it comes to volatility and uh, 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 and uncertainty towards what would happen to the future. And this is basically capital markets. That here you're trading, you're trading in the future, you're trading in time. Uh, you're hoping by by buying a certain stock that it would outperform given the the, the performance of the underlying asset itself, which is the company, uh, and uh, uh, in the real economy. In fact, you're not you're not disentangled, or you're not uh, working in 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 the outer space uh, beyond the real economy or operations. And here it takes us to the point of importance that the central bank support uh, to capital markets. Yes, uh, is quite very much needed uh, as we can be elaborating uh, in some points that I'm going to discuss. However, what was uh, most important and of paramount, uh, uh, I would say, importance uh, is the support to the real economy itself, because at the end, capital markets and the listed securities do reflect the performance of companies that is impacted by the real the performance of the real economy itself. And um, um, probably the, the, the main challenge that any central bank and any policymaker during the COVID-19 period uh, or the pandemic of COVID-19 is the disruption in every single aspect of the operations uh, in an economy and uh, a company per se. So basically you will find that uh, supply chains are being disrupted. Uh, so companies were not capable of, of easily getting their supplies of uh, uh, intermediate goods or, or raw materials to manufacture it and then to sell it to the ultimate consumer. And the ultimate consumer uh, f found it difficult given either because of unemployment rates that has been on the rise, uh, uh, income loss due to uh, COVID-19 and uh, the job losses that could have been happening uh, and so on and so forth. So basically the, uh, this difficulty required intervention not only in capital markets and financial markets to ensure uh, its smooth operations, uh, like I'm going to discuss very briefly, but as well is to ensure that uh, uh, the economy is, is responding uh, uh, or to have at least a soft landing uh, with COVID-19 repercussions. And hence came the support to the suppliers, as, uh, uh, as Dr. Wasim uh, mentioned, uh, that definitely support has been provided to the importers of raw materials and intermediate goods to be able to withstand this uh, difficult times. Uh, support has been given in terms of interest payments uh, as well uh, and postponing the interest payments for, uh, uh, I think, six months uh, to enable the companies to withstand this point from uh, that issue, as well consumers. Uh, have been have been waived the interest rate for a, a period of six months. Uh, when you look at the number of initiatives that have been provided to the manufacturing sector and the mortgage finance sector as well, and all of this was a prerequisite to provide support to capital markets or for uh, the financial sector in general. Otherwise, uh, you can provide whatever mean of support uh, to uh, to the capital markets and the stability of capital markets. However, if you don't ensure that there is proper operations in the real economy and proper support to the different uh, uh, points on the value chain, you would find it very difficult to, uh, to, to have this support sustainable. So uh, when it comes to capital markets, we, we have seen a concerted action, actually not only from the central bank and the exchange uh, operating in the market, but we've seen a concerted action between the different players in general. We found the government acting uh, uh, swiftly with us in, in some of the measures. We found the regulator working with us in some measures. And we found uh, that the capital market regulators, and we found the central bank as well, uh, uh, paving the way for uh, further stability in the market. And when we get to see uh, pre those measures and post those measures, uh, I believe 18th of March uh, is quite an evident date for the Egyptian case whereby prior to that, on, uh, prior to 18, or uh, the last day of the 18th of March, you get to see the volatility levels. It was quite significant, I have to say. It was quite pressuring as well. Uh, and the challenge of continuing the market operations, as I mentioned, is one of the key pillars and one of the most uh, aspects that needs to be respected by every single exchange is the freedom by investors to entry of exit, uh, of entry and exit of the market is one of the paramount uh, uh, and un, uh, unquestionable points to be uh, to be maintained. 
post 18th of March, uh, and I will say why, uh, we got to see a significant decline in the volatility levels, and probably even though I'm not commenting and I should not be commenting, and an improvement in the price directions as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, but this is, has not been the driver to all of the reforms. Some of the reforms uh, was driven by the exchange and the regulator is facilitating uh, extensively the process of having companies to buy their own stocks because they buy which is called treasury treasury shares because they, they know the the intrinsic value of these uh, uh, of these companies and these entities and it's a signaling and messaging to investors that the company itself is believing in its performance and believing in the stock price and hence uh, they went to the market and they bought a significant amount of stocks during that period uh, showing to the market and signaling to the market that we as management of companies have certainty have ha sort of certainty it, of course we would no one would have full certainty towards the future however we have some sort of uh, confidence let's put it that way about how these companies are going to uh, operate and deal with the covid 19 uh, aftermath and uh, uh, and repercussions and then we had another action uh, concerted as well uh, by the government of Egypt and the Ministry of Finance, whereby we proposed uh, slashing uh, uh, the stamp duties significantly by 70, uh, by 66% basically uh, for uh, residents uh, and reducing it as well for non-residents. And that, and that was taken place and as well slashing the tax taxes uh, on dividends distributions. Uh, and this was another concerted action by the government at that point of time. And, and in here I'm not talking about the technological advancements that we've done because the, the electronic uh, 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 voting uh, uh, mechanisms that have been approved by regulators to allow for the general assemblies to take place. But then came one of the most important, uh, I would say, uh, p pillars was the announcement of the banking sector in general. And here it, was, it wasn't the central bank per se, but it was the banking sector operating in Egypt that uh, they are going to increase their investments in listed securities, and that was another signal uh, to the market that uh, we believe uh, uh, that the valuation of companies is quite, uh, I would say, underpriced, and hence they are increasing significantly. And that was with a significant magnitude of around 3.5 billion Egyptian pounds uh, 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 during during the period of uh, uh, of post uh, 18th of March, starting from 19th of March. As well, there has been. Uh, an initiative, a great initiative announced by the uh, president of the Arab Republic of Egypt um, uh, through the Central Bank of Egypt, it was, going, it was going to be implemented through the Central Bank, is for the creation of um, a trading stability mechanism. This mechanism uh, did not aim and is not aiming for any uh, price directions, but is to ensure the continuity of trading and the continuity of, uh, uh, of opening the markets towards all types of investors, not only foreign, because at the end, foreign investors, they, they're going to look to our markets when they ensure or are sure that domestic investors are, are as well being trading in the market. Uh, when you look at the breakdown of any uh, investment in our markets, you will get to see it's around 30 to 70, 30% 30 could be uh, non, uh, non-residents or, or, or foreign investors, and around 70 to 80% would be domestic investors. And hence, the concept of creating uh, a stability fund in other markets, they, they could have named it a market-making fund uh, I believe one of my colleagues can be can be uh, discussing it uh, in, uh, in 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 whatever session. But in all cases, that was a stability fund with a magnitude of 20 billion. And bear in mind the announcement of having this sort of uh, market continuity fund and stability fund in itself had a positive impact on the market. And probably not much. I'm not aware of the figures, but not much of the figures. Uh, needed to be even used because this is used like central banks are the lenders of last resort, as we got to know, and we have seen by the IMF as well, trying to uh, ensure that uh, credit markets are operating efficiently and there is liquidity in those markets to ensure that the intermediation process is, is up and running. The same applied uh, with the creation and the establishment of those types uh, of funds or stability mechanisms uh, that is not interfering with market dynamics whatsoever. It is to ensure that there is always a continuous market for trading to allow uh, foreign and domestic residents and non-resident investors uh, uh, the right of trading on the particular stocks that are listed and traded on uh, on the market. I, I don't want to take much more time in uh, in my answer, I, I, I hope I, I touched and covered the, 
your question. I'll, I'll get back to you on some comments, but I, I want to go to uh, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Khalifa. Uh, Bahrain Bourse is, is one of the dearest uh, markets to my heart. Uh, and I know your personal love as well to uh, technology. And you're, uh, uh, you're doing too much effort to bring in more technology companies to list. Uh, and we have seen globally that in COVID-19 cases that technology companies were the one who actually won and uh, achieved very high performance rates in, and returns during the crisis. So I would like to know from you what happened exactly in Bahrain during the COVID-19, the Bahrain Bourse, what kind of actions you have taken and your insight on how to involve more technology companies in our part of the world to be more resilient as you have seen in some markets. Uh, well, first, I would like uh, to thank you all for inviting me to this conference. And uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, uh, I had all the points to, uh, to mention them, but you mentioned all the points uh, that's uh, very important to say, uh, that the exchanges are market operators and not market participants, which I agree with you fully. Uh, Central thank Bank uh, didn't directly uh, affect or support capital market, but mostly indirectly. The actions that has been taken uh, from Central Bank uh, with the context of uh, Bahrain uh, being an all-in-one regulator uh, has been extensive. So the indirect uh, effect, obviously, the payment deferrals on individuals and companies uh, with their loans, as well as uh, the uh, compensation, state compensation scheme where they um, pay the salaries of, of uh, affected private uh, companies and and those messages that has been sent to the market affected our capital market and we've seen it uh, through uh, the uh, what uh, mr rami was saying uh, the exit of uh, or or the uh, more uh, buy orders that are sort of more sell orders than buy orders at the beginning of the period and uh, we've seen recovery lately uh, the past uh, two months um, where these messages came and, and you could see the positive feedback. Uh, in terms of uh, Central Bank being an all-in-one regulator, uh, they support us as well in terms of uh, allowing the e-vote uh, to uh, uh, vote on more important uh, or more uh, substantial matters in the AGM. Um, and this will link to the question Mr. Rami said about technology. So. Um, one of the main challenges we had uh, during COVID-19, you know, uh, everyone, I guess, know that during March and April is where uh, AGMs, most of the companies' AGM occur. And um, uh, we were um, in a position where we would either uh, postpone AGMs for companies or allow companies to have virtual AGMs, fully virtual from A to Z. And uh, we obviously chose uh, the, the second option. Uh, it was challenging because we didn't have the full ecosystem and the technology in hand, but we worked hand in hand with uh, other capital market participants to uh, or, or technology providers to be able uh, to to run the AGM smoothly. And thankfully, we uh, uh, organized uh, all the AGMs of the companies successfully without any errors and I guess that that was the biggest challenge for us um, and you could see the importance where uh, without AGMs uh, many of the decisions critical decisions whether it's dividend distribution or other matters uh, will be postponed which will also indirectly uh, or directly affect the uh, capital market the uh, in terms of the the uh, technology we uh, established the digital transformation uh, committee uh, back in 2019 before COVID and we had a, a fully detailed roadmap to roll out our uh, services in that regard uh, up until 2023. Uh, but uh, COVID-19 uh, definitely accelerated those efforts and uh, we were able to roll out uh, some of them such as the e-voting and, and virtual AGM. Uh, and also we uh, provided more uh, services in terms of the post rate services uh, to investors and, and companies in, in terms of the corporate actions. Um, overall, we uh, think the central bank is, is an integral part, 
especially in the depth uh, instrument. I think uh, uh, the, the uh, depth instrument uh, in the context of Bahrain, uh, we have more activity there uh, and, and uh, more demand. So uh, I know it's opposite of uh, many other jurisdiction, uh, but in case of Bahrain, we uh, think the central bank and the government issuance of bond uh, have positive messages as well. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Ayman, coming from the, the idea of supporting the private sector, and a lot of the scholars have argued whether the liquidity injections that happened by whether central banks or uh, state-owned banks slash funds to uh, the markets, that would have been in a better use to be directed directly to the corporates itself in order to support the cash flows and thus supporting and enhancing the fundamentals of the business itself, thus the, would reflect on the share price. What do you think of this argument? Uh, are you pro-injecting directly into the market and some see it as an easy exit to investors or to have supported the, the corporates itself? Well, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, thank you, first of all, on behalf of the Islamic Corporation uh, for the development of private sector. As a private sector arm of the Islamic Development Bank Group, I'd like to extend my appreciation to the Union of Arab Bank. Um, to start with, I would like to say, of course, uh, this is the first global pandemic in over 100 years, along the biggest economic crisis in the Great Depression. Um, on the financial front, uh, the financial space in the post-COVID-19 world will probably never be the same again. Um, the world banking sector is facing COVID-19 crisis with much stronger capital position than ahead of the last global crisis, 2007-2008. But on the bright side, banks entered the pandemic crisis with much stronger liquidity than 2007-2008. Uh, we, as a group of uh, Islamic Development Bank, have put together a package of $2.3 billion to support the COVID-19. Uh, we specifically, as ICD, which is uh, the private sector enabler, uh, we cover 55 member countries. And it goes uh, all the way from Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Sultan of Brunei, uh, Pakistan, uh, and comes to all the GCC countries, Turkey, uh, North Africa from Egypt all the way to Morocco and uh, West Africa, Senegal, and all the way to uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Um, so it's a range of uh, countries that we look at. And we have 119 financial institutions in our network uh, where we have uh, shareholding in. Uh, and some of those or majority of them. And we, the way how we function is by providing line of finance. And that line of finance goes directly into the SMEs. And it provides financing for those SMEs on the ground. And we found that that's the most efficient way to reach out to the markets much faster. Um, it's easier for a bank to put an evaluation of an entity, it's easier for them to monitor them, uh, to uh, get into credit relationship and uh, monitoring the relationship and then exiting from it. Uh, that's a way for handling this. But we found out on the other side that all developmental institutions were uh, the best way to basically counter the COVID-19 uh, issues. Uh, even in 2008, uh, the development institution or the multilateral banks have been the ones that really uh, provided the funding when everybody else was actually leaving the markets. So it's again the same thing this time. Um, but we in ICD also provide different services. Uh, other services is also to issue sukuk, And we have been doing it for countries with their local currencies. And that helps a lot too, because then you'll be able to go for somewhat of large cap transactions where mid and small size SMEs will be able to benefit out of those transactions and be working on those. We found that's another way of closing the gap because we found out that the world needs, even before COVID-19, 
four trillion dollars worth of developmental support, of which developmental institution can provide barely 200 billion. So in order to close the gap, we believe that going to the capital markets is the way to go forward. And that's the way how to close that gap and be able to move faster, bigger. So if we provide $100 million, let's say line of finance to an institution, we could also provide $100 million to one transaction. But if we provide $100 million in a Sukuk issuance for an entity in a country, it could actually have a size of $1 billion. In this way, our $100 million gets multiplied 10 times and becomes much bigger, much more beneficial, and much more focused into a transaction. Another thing that uh, we have also created with an ICD is a platform where we connected all those 119 financial institutions. We found out it's even during this pandemic, it was very helpful to have the financial institutions that know us and know each other due to having the relationship with us basically communicate with each other, we're able to provide financing to trade, financing to agriculture, financing to uh, uh, other uh, kind of transactions because they felt comfortable. They were able to communicate with each other on our platform and exchange transactions and be able to be closer. So if we had a bank, let's say in Tunisia and Morocco, they were able to exchange clients that they had trust on both sides. And that was extremely helpful also in our opinion. So FinTech is the future to really support lots of these type of, uh, let's say, economic uh, downturns, but also during positive economic uh, uh, outlook, we will be able to use FinTech to give the largest benefit. Now the crowdfunding uh, in some uh, countries that we are in, we found out has been also extremely helpful because a lot of people have investments and a lot of people would like to invest their money and they don't have really much access, let's say, to the capital markets like in uh, uh, developed institutions, but in our 55 countries, there are some countries where they would love to see transactions within their own village or in their, within their own city. And uh, crowdfunding structures uh, have been very um, positive in that sense. So uh, this is the quick feedback that I can give. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Mansouri, are you, are you still with us? Yes, yes, I am with you. Fantastic. So we know that uh, BDL has uh, asked most of the Lebanese banks to increase uh, their capital base. And uh, the two biggest Lebanese banks are already listed on, on uh, Beirut Stock Exchange. Uh, Tell me more about your anticipation about that, the capital increase happening on the stock market. How do, how do you feel about that inside BDL? What are you doing to uh, help with that as well? Uh, listen, this is a uh, very important issue, as you may uh, uh, guess now in Lebanon. Uh, after the decision of uh, the Lebanese government to default on euro bonds, uh, there were a direct impact on uh, banks on the liquid, liquidity and solvency of banks. So uh, what we are working on is to uh, regain trust by, uh, by making uh, better solvency and liquidity uh, into the system. And uh, the most important thing will be also a fair evaluation of the stocks of, of banks, of the value of capital of banks. Uh, to do all this, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we, we have issued, as I have said a few moments ago, a, a circular in order to uh, ensure the solvency and liquidity and to make this fair evaluation in uh, the view of uh, uh, the decision of the government to default on euro bonds. As you know, banks in Lebanon holds about $10 billion uh, in, uh, of euro bonds. Uh, yes. the, the standard banks holds uh, uh, five uh, about six billion dollars also in euro bonds. So if you are defaulting, we have to make an ECL uh, uh, provisions uh, in banks and all this will affect the real uh, value of uh, bank shares. Uh, I believe that uh, what, we, what is very important for capital markets in the coming uh, few, uh, in the coming future, uh, when, and when we talk about uh, capital increase, Capital increase will come, as, as I have said, from the 20% that we ask banks to, to add that, and 
also from the voluntary uh, uh, participation of depositors on, into those captors. And this is where fair evaluation of captors is very important. And uh, capital uh, markets uh, will be where the people can, when they buy, uh, buy stock in those uh, banks, they can exchange those stocks and they can trade those stocks. Besides, if you are taking about, talking about perpetual bonds, Perpetual bonds will be another way to restructure uh, and uh, to uh, lesser the burden on Lebanese banks and also to be tra tradable through uh, uh, those uh, CMA uh, in Lebanon also. Fantastic. So uh, I'll, I want to take uh, a comment from uh, Dr. Farid again about uh, technology and what happened, especially with the COVID-19. And since we have many bankers here uh, on, uh, with us on the, in, uh, on the call, uh, one dear case and one of the listed companies that is very dear to my heart is Fauri. And we have seen uh, Fauri is a mega fintech company in, in Egypt has been listed than, less than one year. And uh, during uh, the COVID-19, it was one of the main gainers of uh, the COVID-19 situation, and we have seen it that by passing the, the trillion dollar valuation, uh, the one billion dollar valuation, I'm sorry, uh, and bypassing by that the valuation of several uh, on, uh, banks listed, listed on EGX. What do you think about that? Um, I believe technology uh, had a boost. Uh, basically what happened uh, what happened in uh, in COVID-19 and the repercussions associated with it and the reliance on technology gave a boost to uh, any, uh, I would say, technology-driven uh, company uh, uh, for any certain application. When you get to see the usage of programs like the one we're using nowadays, Zoom and otherwise, uh, and the likes, uh, when you get to see not only Zoom and any other program, basically, uh, the Microsoft Teams and so on and so forth, you will get to use uh, a tremendous uh, and exponential increase in the usage given that uh, COVID-19. But, but I believe these changes are not associated only with COVID-19. Uh, these changes are here to stay. The modus operandi in general associated with, uh, with the travel and meetings and conferences probably is going to change uh, uh, permanently. Um, uh, because of what we have seen uh, and what happened in COVID-19. My, my key two sentences here, uh, basically what used to take 10 years probably will take 10 months. Uh, this would be my very short answer, uh, that technology uh, adoption is going to be very fast as compared to what uh, has happened uh, uh, before in the previous years. So one, one of the examples that we have is, and as uh, rightly so, uh, Sheikh Khalifa, my dear colleague Sheikh Khalifa mentioned uh, about the Bahrain boards uh, of rolling over the programs for electronic voting for boards and general assemblies. Uh, for example, this was one of the things that EJX had, had ready, uh, but the adoption for it was very slow. But the moment that you, you got a curfew and people were afraid of, uh, of meeting each other because of the pandemic and the virus itself, you get to see that the demand increased exponentially and meetings are being held through these programs to facilitate. So going forward, um, the challenge, I believe, uh, that capital markets and especially probably in our Arab region, and uh, probably anyone could correct me, but th this is my initial take about it. Um, uh, the challenge would be in the initial valuations of those companies and the IPOs. People in the Arab region are very much accustomed to uh, uh, real assets, we're talking about either uh, a real estate or even a manufacturing whereby you have, you, ha you have a machine that is manufacturing a particular product and so on and so forth. Uh, we have not been accustomed across the years or uh, oil and gas sector that you have a drilling company or if you're, if you're working upstream or downstream you have like, uh, like uh, an oil refining thing. So, so uh, getting accustomed to assets that are not backed by, I would say, real assets would be one uh, of the game changers going forward and one of the challenges as well. Uh, initially, it would always be quite uh, difficult uh, 
uh, in the initial stages to comprehend why the valuations might not be uh, might not be as accustomed to other investors. And here, I'm not talking as an exchange because at the end, I'm not concerned about valuations, but I'm I'm saying the general tendency of of these uh, of these issues. Uh, and then you will find that technology is going to be adopted more and more going forward, and plenty of these uh, potential participants uh, are going to uh, get to uh, be listed and traded and to be available for more investors to be participating in it. So, <clears throat> so the, 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 the game changer was the uh, speed of adoption. That is one of the game changers. And that's why you will find the heightened demand on any technology company or technology based companies associated with uh, distribution and associated with uh, ease of, of, of payments and associated with uh, whatever mean of technology that connects people and uh, facilitates the day to day living. Uh, of, of, of people and the other game changer would be the new acceptances about the methods of valuation for the IPOs and the methods of valuations for companies uh, and as you rightly so mentioned uh, that the case of Fauri is, is a case it has been um, IPO'd last year in August um, in the month of Ramadan I believe or at the end of month of Ramadan and uh, since that date, it has been performing quite well. Uh, but probably Fauri is not uh, the typical entrepreneurial, uh, I would say, company per se, given that it has day one being backed by the entire financial sector or a big spectrum of uh, the banks have been, have been participating and supporting the company day one. However, their success is definitely one of the key stories to be told. And, and hopefully... Uh, it doesn't have to be replicated, but the likes of it uh, to be to be uh, done in the future. Fantastic. I think that's all the time that we have for today. I would like to thank my fellow panelists on their uh, fantastic contribution. I'll go back to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Wissam, to conclude the day. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh... Rami, for this great uh, moderation. Thanks for all the speakers, for their excellencies. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Sheikh Khalifa, very honored to have you today. Mr. Uh, Ayman as well, thank you so much for your participation. Dr. Farid Saleh, I thank you for your time as well. Dr. Mansouri, everybody, uh, Dr. Jihad Al-Wazir, Mr. Kali, uh, I'm not sure if the Jihad, Wazir, and uh, Mr. Kelly, they are still with us uh, from Washington. I'm, um, I'm here, but I have to go to a meeting exactly right now. So, All right, so we're finishing in minutes. Uh, I don't know if you have any message before you leave, because I know that tomorrow uh, you cannot participate since we're going to start uh, uh, early, like, uh, mid, uh, like at 12 noon. Uh, Cairo time, uh, Beirut time actually, so it's gonna be very, very early for you. So any message before you just I, leave? I, I wanna thank Sam for organizing this very enriching discussion and then for this, these great panels that you have uh, uh, assembled and uh, wish you all the best uh, and hope that next year we can meet where uh, no longer we see COVID and we can meet face to face. Thank and you, Kelly, the... do you have any, any closing message? No, just thank you very much so for the opportunity to um, to talk to your members. And if people have got any questions, please uh, don't get hesitate to get in touch. All right. So thank you all. Thank you for all the participants. Uh, we took note for all the questions. We will try to answer them by tomorrow. We don't, we don't have any time for today. Uh, i see you tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we'll have to continue in, uh, in English for today. Uh, welcome to the second day of our webinar. And uh, we have seen yesterday very, very valuable discussions uh, with several stock exchanges and the IMF and the different unions and federations participating in this webinar. We have seen a lot of interesting ideas and uh, interesting points. And we'll, today we will continue the discussion with a very interesting panel around the role of Arab banks in developing capital markets and how it could be a long-term financing mechanism in uh, the Arab economies. 
On this panel, we have my very dear friend and brother, Mr. Mazen Al-Wazaifi, the CEO of Amman Stock Exchange. Uh, also, Mr. Ziad Khalaf, the chairman of International Development uh, Bank, and Dr. Antoine Sfer, attorney in law in Beirut and Paris. Welcome, everyone, to the panel. Maybe if we can, like, like what we've done yesterday, to give a briefing about uh, how did Amman Stock Exchange, Mr. Madden, dealt with the COVID-19 situation. Uh, I know that you had to shut down uh, the trading for uh, a good couple of weeks. Maybe you can give us more background on that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, my dear friend uh, Rami, and uh, good afternoon for everyone. I would like first to thank you very much to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me and having me on, uh, on this session. And also, I'll take this opportunity to express my sincere and deepest uh, heartfelt uh, sympathy and condolences with the uh, people, our brotherly people of Lebanon, and uh, wish uh, a speedy recovery for the injured and a speedy recovery for Lebanon to overcome uh, all these diff difficult circumstances. Uh, well, actually, as everybody know, uh, this pandemic has imposed heavy burden on uh, uh, economic activities and on financial uh, uh, sectors, and especially also the, the stock exchanges. Uh, it has been, this burden has been characterized by uh, its uncertainty and, uh, 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 and significant uh, uh, harm to, uh, to, to, the, to the financial sector. Uh, uh, Amanix Stock Exchange actually uh, uh, suspended trading uh, by uh, uh, a government decision uh, on the 17th of, of, of March. What we did actually, uh, th that decision was taken uh, since the government uh, uh, has also a decision to close all the economic activities in the country, also to impose curfew, full curfew, comprehensive curfew was imposed uh, uh, in the country. Uh, that was actually, uh, 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 that was uh, uh, by the government, uh, it's a government decision, to ease the repercussions of this pandemic uh, and also uh, uh, to face this, these negative repercussions on, on the economy and also on the capital market and to protect investors and, 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 and companies. Uh, after we return back to, uh, before that actually, Mass Stock Exchange in, a co in, in cooperation with the, uh, with the commission uh, took a number of, dis of, of, of decisions and uh, uh, we used uh, certain tools uh, to, uh, to minimize uh, 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 the, the effect uh, uh, of the uh, of this uh, pandemic uh, on 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 the the the, the, the stock exchange, uh, the main tools actually used are we have uh, we have lowered the the the, the percentage of the uh, movement of the stock prices movements from ten percent to uh, flat for all sec for all segments of of of, of the stock exchange from ten percent to 2.5 percent, and also in accordance with the, with the regulator, with this, with the Jordan Securities Commission, uh, we've lowered the uh, the margin uh, uh, requirements uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the over loans uh, granted by uh, brokers to to investors, uh, and also we have contingency plan to uh, to allow. Uh, the stock exchange and also to the brokerage firms to work remotely in order to, uh, uh, to resume trading at any time uh, decided by the government. Uh, so, uh, as we all know, a number of, uh, uh, of stock exchanges use these tools to uh, minimize the effect uh, and repercussions, negative repercussions of this pandemic by using circuit breakers, uh, uh, using a dynamic uh, restrictions on short selling, uh, margin requirement, uh, and daily movements like uh, uh, we've, we've, uh, uh, we've taken. Uh, 
Also, we minimized uh, the, the trading hours from two hours to, to one hour. Uh, the suspension of trading uh, lasts for uh, 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 more than 50 days, actually. Exactly 53 days. And when we came back to, uh, to resume trading, the same, the same procedures, actually, were imposed on the market. The limits, uh, we kept the limits to 2.5, uh, the movements of limits up and down, uh, the margin financing from uh, 22, 15, then to, to 10, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the maintenance margin. Uh, and also we kept the, the trading session for one hour. And then after we resume, trading, the assumption of the, the assumption of trading, uh, 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 we've changed the, the percentage for the movements of stock prices from 2.5 to 5. Since we return back to normal trading, up and down, uh, I, I think that we've succeeded in maintaining safe, let's say, safe landing. Uh, the stock exchange actually uh, for seven sessions decline and then for eight sessions uh, uh, increase uh, after the seven sessions. So the, 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 the trading uh, returned back to its normal, uh, uh, let's say, norm. So uh, I, I, and now, yeah. Yeah, and now we, uh, uh, I consider that we, yes, yeah. Uh, Excuse me to interrupt, Your Excellency, you, you may speak in Arabic, by the way, because most of the attendees today are Arabic speakers, so it's really up to you if you would like to speak in Arabic. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay, it's okay. Yes, uh, the uh, okay. ف... Uh, لما الآن السوق عاد إلى التداول عاد إلى وضع طبيعي إحنا الآن يعني يومين بيطلع ثلاث أيام بنزل يوم بيطلع يوم بنزل فإحنا we're يعني back to uh, back on the track خلينا نحكي للوضع الطبيعي في موضوع التعامل ب أو التداول في 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 بورصة عمان آه البنك المركزي أنا كنت أنتظر امبارح إنه البنك المركزي إنه لكن للأسف ما ما حضر آه الأخ آه دكتور ماهر يعني البنك المركزي الأردني اتخذ آه عدة خطوات آه في مجال آه تعزيز السيولة في الاقتصاد بشكل عام آه اتخذ إجراءات مثل ما اتخذت العديد من البنوك المركزية اللي هو آه موضوع تأجيل سداد الـ الـ الأقساط موضوع ضخ سيولي بحوالي 550 مليون دينار إلى الاقتصاد تخفيف رسوم في بعض الأحيان على مثلا في شركة ضمان القروض تفرضها تخفيض هذه الرسوم يعني هو كان كل الإجراءات في سبيل أنا بدي أحاول أخذ يعني ما أخذش وقت طويل في سبيل تخفيف الـ 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 أو زيادة السيولة تخفيض الاحتياطي الإجباري أيضا للبنوك فهي كانت مجموعة من القرار أيضا the banks were ordered البنوك كانت طلبوا كمان عدم not to pay dividends للمساهمين وهذا ساهم في زيادة سيولة البنوك لكن أيضا أثر على السوق بشكل أو بآخر يعني هناك مجموعة من الإجراءات اتخذها البنك المركزي يعني لا شك أنه موضوع السشن موضوع البنوك وسوق رأس المال أنا باعتقادي هما يعني بيعتبروا دائما البنوك قطاع البنوك is a competitor to the stock market أنا I don't think that the, 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 the banks are competitors البنك ليست منافس هي يعني السوق هي منافس بشكل أو بآخر لكن لكن انا اعتقد ان هم يجب ان يكونوا متكاملين البنك قطاع البنوك يجب ان يتكامل مع مع الساك اكستشينج او الكابيتال ماركت وي ار نوت كومبيتيتورز وي ار وي وي كومبليمنت ايتش اذر 
احنا لازم يكون في تكامل وليس وليس تنافس الجهتين يوفروا مهمه جدا في الاقتصاد ومهمه جدا لتحقيق التنميه الاقتصاديه احنا الاثنين قطاعين بنشكل ميكانيزم للتمويل فاحنا يجب ان نتكامل والا نتنافس بحيث انه هذا القطاع يؤثر سلبا على هذا القطاع لذلك يجب ان تكون في كووردينيتد كوبريشن كووردينيتد افورتس مع الريجوليتورز والفاينانشال ماركتس والفاينانشال انستيتيوشنز في القطاع المالي البنك المركزي هيئه الاوراق الماليه مع المؤسسات الماليه بما فيها الستوك اكسشينج تو كووردينيت افورتس حتى احنا نحقق مصلحه القطاع المالي بشكل عام لانه وجود الاثنين مهم والا يطغى طرف على الطرف الاخر موضوع مهم جدا وجود كونتنجنسي بلان في القطاع وهذا احنا اللي سويناه في كبورصه سوينا خطه للطوارئ خطه للعمل عن بعد نفذناها حتى قبل الاغلاق ونفذناها وقت الاغلاق للتعامل وليس ايضا فقط للتداول لايضا للاتصال بالستيك هولدرز باعضائنا الوسطاء بشركات المساهمه العامه فوجود كونتنجنسي بلان وجود كونتينيوتي بلان مهم جدا للاسواق والقطاع المالي بشكل عام. فاذا سمحت انا بدي بس يعني وضعت بعض النقاط ل lessons learned as a conclusion من هذه الباندامك وخلال اللي حدث خلال الفتره الماضيه سنس في عندنا uncertainty عدم وضوح وعدم يقين عالي جدا uncertainty is very huge في السكتر the uncertainty is still there ولا زالت uncertainty موجوده احنا زي ما حكيت في البدايه لازم يكون في عندنا كل السكتر البنوك المؤسسات الماليه الستوك اكسشينجز لازم يكون في عندنا خطه طوارئ خطه ايضا اداره مخاطر في هذه المرحله الجفرمنت انتيتيز الريجوليتورز الفاينانشال انستيتيوشنز لازم يحافظوا على كوردينيشن فيري جود فيري فيري تايت فيري سترونج كوردينيشن تعاون تعاون قوي جدا لمواجهه هذه الازمه البوليسي ميكرز ماست انشور انه الفاينانشال سيستم ريمينز كابل قادر على انه يحفظ الفاينانشال ستابيليتي للفاينانشال سيكتور وانه كما كان يكون قادر على انه تشانل ايضا الفاينانسنج ليكويديتي تو تو ذا بابليك تو انستيتيوشنز تو كوربريشنز ايضا يكون قادر لازم البوليسي ميكرز والريجوليتورز والفاينانشال انستيتيوشنز ذي هاف تو انشور انه 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 الفاينانشال سيكتور قادر على انه يشتغل على من خلال ال ديجيتاليزيشن من خلال الفنتك تولز لانه ثبت التجربه انه وجود انه استخدام ضروري جدا انه يكون في درجه عاليه جدا من القدره على استخدام الادفانسد تكنولوجي ل تو كونتينيو ورك ذا كونتينيوتي اوف ورك والبزنسز في في هذا المجال ايضا قضيه التعامل التعاون على مستوى اون جلوبال ليفل انترناشونال ليفل وي شود هاف فيري سترونج كوردينيشن كوردينيشن بين ريجوليتورز بين فاينانشال انستيتيوشنز وورلد وايد جلوبالي تو اوفركم حتى نتجاوز هذه المرحله وايضا to mitigate risk وايضا نواجه ال repercussions negative repercussions of this uh, pandemic uh, we have to have uh, innovative ideas also to face uh, this uh, pandemic uh, central bank intervention اخر شيء انا اخذت وقت شوي 
السنترال بانك انترفينشن ضروري جدا ل از ماتش فيري ماتش نيدد وذ كوبريشن طبعا مع ستوك ماركت وول ستوك ماركت ل للحفاظ على سلامة القطاع المالي وأيضا سلامة التعامل واستمرارية التعامل والتداول أيضا التداول بكل معاني ليس فقط في ستوك اكسشينج وأيضا التداول والتجارة و لأنه هذا مهم جدا احنا حتى نتجاوز ونخفف آثار هذه المرحلة شكرا جزيلا وإذا في أي شيء أنا شكرا أشكرك أنا هرجع لك تاني وحقيقة أنا عايز أقف عند النقطة المهمة اللي حضرتك أثرتها إنه البورصة وأسواق المال ليست منافس للقطاع المصرفي بأي شكل من الأشكال اللي هم بيتكاملوا أنا دايما بقول إنه الزبون واحد الكاستمر واحد هو بيختار يحط أمواله فين بيضعها في البنوك في شكل ودائع أو شهادات تجارية أو يحب إن هو يستثمرها لأنه من الضروري توفير بدائل استثماريه وفرص استثماريه لكل العملاء في القطاع المالي لان هم كده كده بيستثمروا اموالهم في حاجات ثانيه اذا ما وفرنا لهمش البدائل دي هيضعوها في العقار وهيضعوها في بعض الحاجات الثانيه عاليه المخاطر اللي قد ينتج عنها مشاكل ثانيه. احب اروح لدكتور انطوان العزيز زيك الاول و حابب اعرف منك لبنان بيحصل فيه ايه بقى يعني حضرتك اول حاجه كمحامي وانا امبارح سالت الزملاء من مصر في لبنان على خطه زياره رؤوس الاموال للبنوك المحليه ودي يعني اكبر بنكين في لبنان هم مطروحين في بورصه بيروت فده نتوقع انه ان شاء الله يخلق نوع من انواع السيوله على بورصه بيروت من الناحيه القانونيه والناحيه التشريعيه شايف ايه اللي ناقصنا في لبنان ان احنا نقدر نتحرك بحيث انه بورصه بيروت تكون قاطره للتنميه في هذا المجال اتليست في الخدمات الماليه. اولا احييك وأشكرك على الكلمات العطرة وأحيي زملاء المشاركين في هذا المؤتمر واتحاد المصارف العربية والصديق أمينه العام الذي يعني يؤمن أن الديمومة هي في العمل مهما كانت الظروف صحية أو اقتصادية أو ما سواها حقيقة الموضوع المطروح هو موضوع يتعلق بآلية التمويل من خلال الدخول إلى سوق البورصة السوق ال- التي آ- تعطي مجالاً أكبر من البلد الذي يكون فيه آ- الكيان القانوني شركة كانت أم مصرفاً وخصوصاً في قطاع مصرفي كالقطاع اللبناني الذي يعيش اليوم أزمة وهذا ليس سراً آ- رداً على سؤال حضرت حضرة المنسق الجلسة حقيقة تعيش الساحة الاقتصادية في لبنان والمالية والنقدية أزمة مفصلية فهي ليست أزمة عادية وهي لا تشبه الأزمات التي تعيشها المنطقة العربية أو أوروبا أو أمريكا بأزمة الكورونا فيروس وما سواها وتداعياتها فهنا الأزمة مضاعفة لأن أزمة السيولة قد خنقت السوق اللبناني بشكل جعلت التعامل مع البنوك وكأنه شيء يعني غير طبيعي وغير منطقي وغير محبب لا من البنوك تجاه الزبائن ولا من العملاء تجاه البنوك وهذه يعني مسألة خطرة على نظام اقتصادي يعتمد السرية المصرفية منذ العام 1956 وقد عرف بهذا الموضوع من هنا كان هنالك هذا الجذب للرساميل إن كان من الدول العربية الشقيقة أو من الدول الغربية ومن اللبنانيين والعرب المقيمين خارج لبنان إذا الأزمة اليوم أن مصر في لبنان قد أصدر سلسلة تعامي طبعا لا أريد أن أقيم سياسة مصر في لبنان ولا أريد أن أدخل في السياسة ولا في الموضوع الاقتصادي لأن المشكلة اليوم لم تعد تقنية كما هو معلوم وبالتالي أصبحت مثار جدل كبير في السياسة اللبنانية 
واصبح الاقتصاد جزء من اللعبه السياسيه ومن الاستفافات والنقد حتى وصلنا الى سعر صرف للدولار الامريكي في السوق السوداء يوازي 8000 في بعض الاحيان وصل الى 9000 اليوم هو على نطاق 7000 اي ان البضائع قد زادت نحو 300% حتى اليوم اما في حال وقف الدعم فهذه ستكون كارثه على المجتمع اما موضوع الدخول في البورصه والطرح طرح الاسهم اعتقد ان هذا الموضوع سيكون واعدا في لبنان سيكون واعدا من خلال موضوعين الموضوع الاول يتعلق ب ما هي المصارف التي ستذهب هذا المذهب طبعا نحن لدينا عدد كبير من المصارف كما هو معلوم ولكن هذه المصارف وهذا ليس سرا لا يمكنها ان تستمر بهذا العدد لان الازمه قد كشفت الكثيرين وكشفت ان هنالك بعض المصارف لا يمكنها ان تستكمل عملها في القطاع المصرفي وهذا ما اكده بالامس حاكم مصرف لبنان حين قال انه من لا يمكنه ان يعيد الرسمله ويزيد الرسمله بنسبه 20% فانه سيكون خارج السوق اذا التحدي الاول هو استمرار المصارف في ضخ الاموال ل في رؤوس اموال او في اعاده جدوله الديون لبعض الشركات او في اعاده اعمار ما تهدم في بيروت نتيجه الانفجار المعروف اذا هل البنوك قادره انا لا اقول انها غير قادره ولكن على الاقل اقول ان هنالك مشكله سيوله كبيره وبالتالي ليس سرا ايضا ان هنالك مشكله ملاء لهذا السبب اصبح المودع في لبنان لبنانيا ام عربيا ام اجنبيا لا يمكنه ان يسحب ما لديه من اموال من المصارف اللبنانيه بسبب هذه الازمه الخانقه التي على ما اعتقد وانا محام متخصص في قضايا المصارف المساله تتعدى اطار السيوله الى اطار الملاءه من هنا ستخرج مصارف من السوق ولكن عليها ان تخرج ضمن سياق قوانين وانظمه محدده لا تؤدي الى خسائر اكبر واكثر واخطر على المودعين وعلى الشركات اللبنانيه. لذلك في مرحله ثانيه البنوك التي ستبقى هي ملزمه ان تدخل ملزمه معنويا وتقنيا وماليا ان تدخل الى البورصه، لماذا؟ لكي يكون هنالك رسمله من نوع اخر توازي الرسمله التي اكد عليها التعاميم مصرف لبنان لجهه إعادة تكوين رؤوس الأموال واستنباط البنوك بعدما وصلت الكهوة المعروفة لذلك من الضروري أن تصل إلى إعادة رسملة من خلال طرح الأسهم في سوق الاكسشينج في لبنان هذا من جهة ستوك اكسشينج من جهة ثانية لا أرى حلا إلا من خلال طرح بعض أموال وأملاك وأصول الدولة اللبنانية في قسم منها على الأقل في ستوك إكسشينج على أساس تمويل هذه المؤسسات ما تعطيه من نتائج وهذا التمويل يعطى كبدائل ولو غير كافية للمودعين الذين خسروا ودائعهم بسبب توظيف المصارف للأموال حصريا في في البنك المركزي وقيام البنك المركزي بتمويل الدوله التي هي على شفير الافلاس للاسف. ذلك اذا هنالك ثلاثه اطر، الاطار الاول من سيبقى من المصارف في لبنان؟ ثانيا المصارف التي ستبقى عليها موجب ان تدخل لتؤمن جزء من تمويلها ورسملتها اضافه الى ما سيقوم به رؤسائها وأعضاء مجلس إدارتها ومالكوها مالكو الأسهم هنالك رسملة من العموم أيضا ثالثا هنالك أصول للدولة اللبنانية ستطرح إلى للعموم من خلال برنامج إطفاء الدين وإعادة بعض أموال المودعين لا سيما المودعين الذين خسروا كل ودائعهم يعني الذين لديهم أموال لا تتعدى 300 ألف دولار أو في أحسن الأحوال 500 ألف دولار وهذا جنى العمر يعني وكانه يعني اخذ تعويضا او كان اصبح في سن متقدمه لم يعد قادرا على العمل وهذه هي الثروه التي تؤمن له هذه الضمانات. 
من جهه ثانيه اذا سمحت لي لا اريد ان اخذ وقتي وقت غيري ولكن هنالك مساله تطرح اليوم رايت من خلال وانا محام في نقابه في نقابه المحامين في باريس هذا التواصل العضوي بين البنوك المركزيه الوطنيه في اوروبا والمصارف المحليه هناك من جهه وبين البنوك المركزية في الاتحاد الأوروبي بسبب أزمة كورونا هذا ما لم نراه في دولنا العربية الشقيقة يعني هنالك أزمة تتخطى الحدود أو عابرة للحدود وتداعياتها السياسية والاقتصادية والقانونية لماذا قانونية؟ لأنه ليس سرا أن هنالك ألاف الشركات قد أصبحت في واقع الإفلاس أو في أحسن الأحوال في واقع الإعسار أي أنها لم تعد قادرة على الدفع ولا على القبض بسبب أزمة كورونا وتداعياتها ورسملتها في بعض الأحيان لضخها المال في بعض القطاعات التي أصبحت مشلولة تماما بحكم هذا الفيروس في عبر العالم إذا في دولنا العربية الشقيقة هذا التعاون لم نرى نظما قانونية تقوم في أي دولة تستطيع أن تواجه الأزمات القانونية المحتملة على الصعيد المصرفي وعلى صعيد ضخ رأس المال من خلال تداعيات أزمة كورونا التي إذا انتهت في آخر السنة بإذن الله ستنتهي لأنه نحن مؤمنين وأكيد ربنا أعطانا يمكن أمثولة ولكن لن يكون لن يج... لن يفتح المجال أكثر لأنه هنالك كارثة بشرية على البشرية ولكن تداعيات أزمة كورونا المصرفية والنقدية والتجارية والقانونية لأنه في ناس وقعت في الإعصار والإفلاس والموضوع سيأخذ سنوات طويلة إذا نحن بحاجة إلى نظم محلية وإقليمية بين دولنا العربية الشقيقة ويعني هذا الموضوع ليس ترفا وليس تعاونا بروتوكوليا إنما هو تعاون قانوني مصرفي مالي مفروض أن يكون لأن المشكلة لا 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 تنحصر في دولة، لا أريد أن آخذ لبنان مثلا، لأنه لبنان كما تعرفون يعيش أزمة كيانية أحشائية، لا تختلف عما تعيشه بعض المناطق العربية، حتى المناطق التي فيها نزاعات تختلف أزمتها عن أزمة لبنان، لا أقول أكثر أو أقل ولكن تختلف، إن كان ليبيا أو اليمن أو سوريا أو العراق. إذا اليوم طرح هذا الموضوع من قبل اتحاد المصارف هو وضع اليد على الجرح أي أننا نحن بحاجة إلى ما يواجه المقتضيات الخطيرة التي يمكن أن تهدد الاقتصادات المحلية والمنزلية أي الناس الذين لديهم أعمال أو الذين لديهم ديون أو الذين لديهم مشاريع قد بدأوا بها وقد أخذوا أخذوا ديونا أو أو long term loans أو أو ما سوى اذا هذا الموضوع يعني باختصار ارجو ان اكون قد اوفيت بـ بـ بالطرح الذي طرحتموه حضره منسق الجلسه اكيد عليك وفيت طبعا وهي فرصه جيده انا دايما بقول للزملاء هنا في بيروت انه لبنان بيمتلك مجموعه من الاصول او الجواهر المنسيه قد تستطيع ان هي تساعد في دفع عجله التنميه وان انت تطرح هذه الاصول على بورصه الاوراق الماليه او بورصه بيروت هيؤدي بالضروره لخلق قيمه مضافه جديده لهذه الاصول ان هي تكون قاطره للتنميه في لبنان. اعتقد ان احنا هنتحرك دلوقتي للفيديو الخاص بالزميل دكتور زياد مش عارف الفيديو جاهز بتاعه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السادة الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بداية لا بد لي أن أعرب عن شعورنا بالألم أثر الانفجار الهائل في مرفأ العاصمة اللبنانية بيروت الذي أودى بالعديد من الضحايا الأبرياء بالإضافة للدمار بالبنية التحتية للمؤسسات والمنشآت المحيطة بالمرفأ سائلين الله عز وجل الرحمة الواسعة للشهداء الأبرياء والصبر والسلوان لذويهم والشفاء العاجل للمصابين الأخوة والأخوات يسعدني أن أحييكم وأرحب بكم وبهذه النخبة المحترمة 
من أصحاب المعالي والسادة محافظي البنوك المركزية العربية السادة القياديين في القطاعات الاقتصادية والمالية والمصرفية كما أتقدم بالشكر والامتنان للدعوة الكريمة للمشاركة في هذا المؤتمر الهام لاتحاد المصارف العربية والذي يسلط الضوء على دور البنوك المركزية في دعم أسواق رأس المال في ظل جائحة كورونا وكيفية توفير هذه الجهات الرقابية الأدوات والإجراءات والبرامج التحفيزية والتي من شأنها تقليل أثر الجائحة على الأسواق المالية والاقتصاد ككل تفرض جائحة فيروس كورونا تحديا تاريخيا على العالم بأجمعه فما زلنا حتى الآن نشهد تطورات هذه الجائحة وتداعياتها على اقتصادات الدول العربية والعالمية وأسواقها المالية التي تأثرت بشكل مباشر وكبير حيث شهدنا تقلبات كبيرة في حجم التعاملات ومؤشرات الأسواق المالية في الآونة الأخيرة ويبدو أن الاقتصاد العالمي مقبل لا محالة على تراجع إن لم يكن على انكماش حاد والتوقعات الأولية تشير إلى انخفاض النمو هذا العام وقد يشهد العالم أسوأ أزمة اقتصادية منذ الكساد العظيم في ثلاثينيات القرن الماضي كما أن تقارير البنك الدولي وصندوق النقد الدولي تتوقع انكماش الاقتصاد العالمي في حدود 5% ويتوقع أن تصل خسائر الاقتصاد العالمي إلى 12 تريليون دولار وذلك خلال العام 2020 وعلى صعيد الاقتصاد العربي يتوقع, يتوقع أن يكون الانكماش بحدود 7% فنحن متخوفون من أنه كلما طال أمد الصراع مع الفيروس سيؤدي ذلك لارتفاع حالات الإفلاس بين الشركات والبطالة بين المجتمعات وستكون الفئات الأضعف وذو الدخل الأقل هم الأكثر عرضة وستكون لذلك تبعات اجتماعية كبيرة وضغوط هائلة على الحكومات لتعزيز الاستقرار الاقتصادي والاجتماعي وذلك من خلال برامج الإنقاذ والدعم المختلفة وخفض الطرائب بما في ذلك التحديات الكبيرة على البنوك المركزية في مختلف الدول للمحافظة على سعر صرف العملة المحلية مقابل الدولار وفي ظل التغييرات الاقتصادية جراء جائحة كورونا سيطرة المخاوف على الأسواق المالية العالمية والعربية مع افتتاح التداول التجاري للأسهم في بداية الأزمة بسبب أكبر انخفاض تشهده الأسواق منذ الأزمة المالية في عام 2008 حيث سجلت أسواق المال في دول عربية عديدة تراجع بنسبة 10% تقريبا في بورصة أسواقها وجاءت الخسائر أقبى انهيار أسعار النفط التي تراجعت بنسبة 20% مما شكل ضربة موجعة لاقتصادات الدول التي تعتمد على الخام كمصدر رئيسي لإيراداتها بالإضافة لا تراجع أسعار الفائدة المستويات صفرية وسلبية في بعض البنوك المركزية العالمية وكذلك انخفاض مؤشرات البورصات الرئيسية إلى أكثر من 35% وانعكاسها على إداء الأسواق المالية العالمية كما ظهرت بوادر الضغوط في الأسواق الرئيسية للتمويل قصير الأجل وحيث تدهور كبير في حجم السيولة المتوفرة لدى المستثمرين والمحافظة الاستثمارية وبالأخص المستثمرين عن طريق الهامش وكما أن بعضهم اضطروا إلى أغلاق مراكزهم الاستثمارية لسد مطالبات تغطية حساب الهامش واستعادة توازن محافظهم الاستثمارية فإذا أردنا توثيق ما يمر به اقتصادنا حاليا فهو أشبه بالعاصفة المكتملة فقد يواجه مدير الأصول والمحافظة الاستثمارية خروج تدفقات إضافية من صناديقهم الاستثمارية ويضطرون إلى بيع الأصول في سياق هبوط الأسواق مما يمكن أن يفاقم تحركات الأسعار وقد تؤدي مستويات الاقتراض المرتفعة لدى قطاع الشركات إلى حالة من المديونية الحرجة مع حدوث توقف مفاجئ في الاقتصاد ومن المرجح أن يؤدي استمرار آثار الجائحة على القطاعات الاقتصادية إلى ضغوط كبيرة على البنوك والقطاع المصرفي وقد يؤدي هذا إلى زيادة عمليات إعادة هيكلة الديون وانخفاض كبير في هامش الربحية للمصارف وبالتالي قدرتها على توفير هذا الحجم من التسهيلات إضافة للتحديات الحالية التي تواجهها البنوك نتيجة لتفشي الفيروس فمن المرجح أن تؤدي الفترة من أسعار الفائدة المنخفضة إلى فرض مزيد من الضغوط على ربحية البنوك على المدى المتوسط ونحن نرى 
انه سيكون من الصعب على المصارف حتى التي تمتلك حجم اصول ضخمه في تحقيق ارباح بالمستوى التي اعتادت ان تحققه في السنوات الماضيه. وبمجرد انحسار التحديات الراهنه يمكن ان تتخذ البنوك خطوات لتخفيض الضغوط على الارباح بما في ذلك زياده الدخل من الرسوم او تخفيض التكاليف ولقد وقد يكون من الصعب تقليل الضغوط الربحيه بالكامل وعلى المدى المتوسط قد تسعى البنوك الى تعويض ارباحها المفقوده بالافراط في تحمل المخاطر وتستطيع السلطات تنفيذ عدد من السياسات للمساعده على تخفيف عوامل الضعف الناشئه عن المخاطر المفرطه مع توفير تدفق ائتماني بالقدر الكافي الى الاقتصاد بما في ذلك ازاله المعوقات الهيكليه امام دمج البنوك وادراج سيناريو يتميز بانخفاض اسعار الفائده السائده في تقييمات مخاطر البنوك والرقابه عليها واستخدام السياسات الاحترازيه الكليه للتخفيف من قيام البنوك بالافراط في المخاطره لغرض تعويض الارباح. وللحفاظ على استقرار النظام المالي العالمي ودعم الاقتصاد العالمي كانت البنوك المركزية في مختلف بلدان العالم هي خط الدفاع الأول حيث قامت هذه البنوك بتيسير السياسة النقدية إلى حد كبير عن طريق تخفيض أسعار الفائدة الأساسية وهو ما وصل به إلى مستويات منخفضة تاريخية بالإضافة لتوفير سيولة إضافية للنظام المالي سواء من حيث أدواتها التقليدية كعمليات السوق المفتوحة أو من خلال برامج غير تقليدية لشراء الأصول الخطرة بالصورة التي استخدمت أثناء الأزمة المالية العالمية بما في ذلك شراء الأصول الأخطر كسندات الشركات ومن خلال تدخل البنوك المركزية في هذه الأسواق باعتبارها مشتري الملاذ الأخير ومساعدتها على احتواء الضغوط الرافعة لتكلفة الائتمان تضمن لتضمن هذه البنوك استمرار اتاحه الائتمان بسعر معقول لقطاعي الافراد والشركات. ومن اجل ضمان عدم انهيار اسعار الصرف واستمرار تدفق السيوله في الاسواق، اتفق عدد من البنوك المركزيه على زياده تقديم السيوله الدولاريه عن طريق ترتيبات خطوط لتبادل العملات بينها. وقد عملت السياسة المالية على تحفيز الاقتصادات من خلال انفاق استثنائي على البرامج الاجتماعية والمساعدات المالية المباشرة للمتضررين من أثر الجائحة إضافة لتقديم تسهيلات ضريبية متعددة وهو الأمر الذي نجم عنه تزايد العجوزات في الميزانيات الحكومية وارتفاع مستويات الدين العام ومن أجل تمكين البنوك من إداء الدور المأمول منها بادرت البنوك المركزية في العالم ومن خلفها لجنة بازل بإصدار تعليمات وتوجيهات من شأنها أن تخفف القيود الرقابية والتنظيمية على البنوك الأمر الذي ساهم في تقليل أثر الجائحة على القطاع المصرفي والاقتصادي بشكل عام وذلك من خلال توفير خطوط سيولة ميسرة لتمكين البنوك من استخدام قدر أكثر من السيولة لديها في انعاش الاقتصاد بالإضافة إلى قيام البنوك المركزية بإطلاق خطط تحفيز مالي للقطاعات والشركات المتضررة وبالأخص شريحة الشركات الصغيرة والمتوسطة والتي تساهم بشكل كبير في إجمالي الناتج المحلي القومي وذلك من خلال توفير مبادرة تمكن البنوك من توفير تسهيلات ائتمانية ميسرة لهذه الشركات لضمان استمراريتها ومساهمتها في ديمومة الاقتصاد من المعروف أن المصارف العالمية والعربية تلقت ضربة قوية بسبب فيروس كورونا مع ارتفاع نسبة تعثر القروض وانخفاض النشاط الاقتصادي الذي أدى إلى خفض القروض لقطاعي الأفراد والشركات خاصة في الدول التي تعتمد على تصدير النفط وهذا الأمر سيؤدي في نهاية العام إلى تسجيل خسائر في جميع ميزانيات المصارف ولن ينجو منها سوى المصارف ذات الملاءة العالية ولكي تستطيع البنوك العربية من إعادة تدوير العجلة الاقتصادية بشكل فعال يجب أن تلقى رعاية البنوك المركزية لتمكنها بالنهوض بهذا الدور من خلال توفير المزيد من خطوط السيولة بتكلفة أقل وإعادة النظر مؤقتا في المتطلبات الرقابية والتنظيمية وتشجيعها على تأسيس صناديق جماعية لمواجهة تلك التداعيات بصورة أوسع وكلفة أقل حيث كان لافتا سعي صندوق النقد العربي لتحقيق تطوير القطاع المالي في الدول العربية بالتعاون مع الهيئات هيئات الأسواق والأوراق المالية العربية من خلال إعداده لدليل مفصل حول الإجراءات والمبادئ الإرشادية العامة 
لتعامل السلطات الاشرافية مع تداعيات الازمات على اسواق المال في الدول العربية وابرز ما جاء فيه كان تشكيل لجنة ادارة الازمات داخل هيئة الاسواق والاوراق المالية للتعامل مع تداعيات تذبذب اسعار الاسهم وهبوطها الحاد وتعزيز التوعية والتثقيف المجتمعي للحد من الاثار السلبية للشائعات وتشجيع التحول الرقمي وتبني التقنيات الحديثة وانشاء منصات للتداول الالكتروني لاسهم الشركات الصغيرة والمتوسطة والسماح بعقد بعقد الجمعيات العمومية للشركات عبر وسائل دوائر الاتصال الافتراضي وعليه نحن كاصحاب مؤسسات مالية ومصرفية نؤكد على حرصنا للمحافظة على رؤوس الاموال والسيولة اكثر مما كان لدينا في السابق وقد خضعنا لاختبارات الاوضاع الضاغطة لقياس مدى تحمل مؤسساتنا لهذه العوامل والظروف فاثبتنا صلابة قوية ازاء خسائر السوق والتعثر في الائتمان الممنوح كما ان دعم السيولة من البنوك المركزية ساعد على تخفيف مخاطر التمويل مما جعلنا في وضع افضل مما كنا عليه في بداية الازمة المالية العالمية فهناك تحديات كبرى تنتظرنا خلال مرحلة التعافي الاقتصادي من التأثيرات السلبية للوباء وأبرزها هي إعادة صياغة السياسة الاقتصادية للحد من التفاوت الاقتصادي وتحسين الحراك الاجتماعي وتحديد مصادر جديدة للنمو الاقتصادي وموائمة الأهداف الجديدة مع الإداء الاقتصادي في ظل الظروف الاستثنائية التي نعيشها ونظرا لمحورية وأهمية دور البنوك في الاقتصاد سواء تحدثنا على مستوى البنوك العربية أو على مستوى البنوك العالمية فأن المحافظة على سلامة هذه البنوك يجب أن تحظى بأولوية كبيرة لدى المشرعين وأصحاب القرار والبنوك المركزية والبنوك نفسها كي لا يتكرر المشهد الذي شهدناه بعد الأزمة المالية عام 2008 لكي تقوم بدورها الرئيسي بإنعاش الاقتصاد في الختام لا يسعني إلا أن أتقدم بالشكر إلى اتحاد المصارف العربية لدعمه المستمر للمصارف العربية ونشكر الحضور الكرام على حضورهم الطيب معنا بالإضافة إلى شكرنا وتقديرنا لحسن تنظيم هذا المؤتمر الافتراضي أشكر لكم حسن استماعكم وأتمنى لكم السلامة والمستقبل الزاهر شكرا جزيلا زياد اعتقد ان احنا وصلنا كده لنهايه اليوم الثاني ونقدر نقول بعض النقاط الختاميه بنؤكد ثاني على انه دعم البنوك المركزيه العربيه لاسواق المال خلال الشهور الماضيه من عام 2020 اثر ايجابا على اداء البورصات في زميل بيسال على الشات انه ليه دعم البنوك المركزيه ما بانش بشكل اسرع على البورصات العربيه زي الاقتصادات المتقدمه ده يمكن انا هرد بايجاز انه يمكن الاقتصادات المتقدمه تركيبه الشركات اللي موجوده فيها احسن شويه شفنا ان في اكسبوجر اعلى للشركات التكنولوجيه الشركات الخاصه بالاستدامه ودي كانت تاثرها اقل شويه من طبيعه الشركات في منطقتنا العربية ودي استعرضناها امبارح. اتكلمنا كثيرا عن دور البنوك المركزية في ضخ السيولة والسياسات النقدية اللي بتتخذها البنوك لخفض اسعار فائدة اثرت ايجابا بالتاكيد على دخول رؤوس اموال جديدة الى البورصات العربية. في الختام بنؤكد تاني انه اتحاد البورصات العربية مع اتحاد المصارف العربية هيتعاونوا كثيرا في مجالات عده وزي ما ذكرنا امبارح ان شاء الله من الاسبوع اللي جاي هبتدي اتحدث مع زميلي دكتور وسام اتحاد المصارف ازاي نقدر نتحرك ونقارن ما بين الكي واي سي ما بين البورصات او السماصره شركات السماصره الاوراق الماليه والبنوك التجاريه في المنطقه العربيه بحيث ان احنا نقدر أه نشوف ايه اللي ناقص او ايه المختلف ما بين قواعد اعرف عميلك ما بين الخدمتين الماليتين بحيث ان احنا نقدر نصل في الاخر انه في كود مستثمر عربي موحد يسمح بانتقال رؤوس الاموال والاستثمار الغير مباشر بشكل اهين. 